Okay, we're going to start the first session of the Climate Change at the Building Scale Summit. Uh, there will be a second session on uh, April the 5th. Uh, it's been organized by David Benjamin here, Thiad uh, Jamal Eddin here, and myself, Andres Hake. Uh, as Bruno Latour puts it, uh, we live in a new regime, uh, a new climatic regime, and that's something that is shaking our societies uh, in a very deep way. Uh, the building is something that is being redefined, uh, not only the building as, a, as an artifact or as an apparatus, but also the very practice of building, uh, what it means, what it implies, what is the way that we do it. Uh, climate change is not a problem that architecture, better architecture, more effective architecture, more detailed architecture will make disappear. Uh, but something that undermines the modern paradigm in which a big part of design practices have been founded on. Columbia GSAP serves a clear environmental focus. It has, the, this building uh, has a long history of discussing uh, environmental issues, ecological issues, climatic issues, uh, and it's something that has a trajectory. Uh, the urban design initiatives can, have been uh, discussing uh, climate change for a long time. Uh, the Buell Center uh, has posed the question of climate together with the CCA, with the Canadian Center of Architecture, uh, from the perspective of architectural history and uh, theory. Uh, Columbia Books uh, has produced a major uh, work on climate change, climate, architecture, and the planetary imaginarium. Uh, uh, Climate change, uh, in the way it's been discussed here, is both a commitment to face the planetary challenges we face, but also uh, in understanding architectural devices as entities that exist in the interaction with others and, and unfold across scales. Uh, this particular summit is doing something different where, uh, to what has been happening here before. We're looking at the scale of buildings or at the building scale. Climate change as something that is, on the one hand, uh, discussing scales itself and making us understand them differently, but also uh, as a way to discuss what buildings have to do with climate change and what's the way that that very notion is transformed now. Uh, we also interrogate what is uh, uh, the sense of urgency that we're dealing with or what it implies for our practices. That's why we call it summit. Uh, summit because we're uh, facing things that are unavoidable. Uh, it's not an, a cultural speculation, but it's something that we engage politically. And we need also to find ways to situate this discussion, to find particular specific realities we, we can address in detail. Materials, locations, uh, evolution of geographies, forms of politics, uh, specific things that are changing and that we have to re-engage with. It's not about, let's say, keep doing the same things, but also acknowledging that our practices are becoming something very different. We also think of a summit as a place that needs to produce something, needs to produce a knowledge or needs to produce tools or it needs to produce references that somehow change the course of the discussion and the course of practices. So we consider this, and this is something that we've been discussing in depth as a working session that uh, we uh, would encourage everyone to, to, to use as a way to produce knowledge. And we're also thinking of a format that could enable to get in depth. There's a series of pairs, paired conversations among practitioners or uh, teams that basically will talk of a very particular project, one project uh, allowing them there uh, to uh, go in detail, to go in depth into the, uh, the development of, of that project and then having a self-driven uh, uh, self, uh, conversation with their pair. Uh, also, we uh, have done an effort to test or to, to be sensitive and to find or to experiment ways uh, to reduce the, 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 the impact of, uh, the environmental impact of these sessions. Uh, some of the, you will see that some of the people are connecting online, avoiding uh, to increase basically the, the emissions and, and uh, uh, consumptions 
uh, by flying people unnecessarily. And the people that are here that are not based in New York mainly uh, had other things to do. So we're, we're trying also to uh, experiment with the formats. And we, uh, we would very much appreciate uh, your patience if uh, things get difficult at one point. Great. Well, thank you, Andres. Most of you probably know this, but I'm David Benjamin, director of Advanced Studios. And in part of his capacity of co-organizing this, um, uh, Andres is uh, director of the AAD program. So that's partly to say um, that this is a, a series of events that's both um, a required part of the Advanced Studios curriculum. Um, so this is basically a class. Um, but it's also a public forum um, for exploring critical issues that are important to the, to the world more broadly. Um, as Dean Amal Andreos has stated, um, at GSAP, climate change uh, could be considered ground zero for a shared discussion about architecture's engagement with the world. The magnitude and the stakes could not be clearer, but at the same time, architectural action on climate change involves the territory of uncertainty. Climate change is complex and no single formula is adequate. Responding to climate change requires not only technical aspects such as energy consumption and carbon footprint, um, but also social and political aspects such as inequality and public policy. So on the one hand, we might draw on history uh, in these kind of discussions, for example, uh, one interesting reference for me is that in 1973, a young Swiss architect named Walter Stahill was working on a study for the Commission of the European Communities and searching for ways to save large amounts of energy uh, in the construction industry. Uh, instead of looking at technologies such as more efficient lighting or cooling, Stahill actually turned to behavior patterns and socioeconomic issues. In explaining his line of thinking, he noted that Quote, some of our major problems are interlinked and cannot be solved one by one. Stahill and his collaborator, Genevieve Rede Mulvey, uh, eventually reached the conclusion that these problems could be best addressed by uh, their term, substituting manpower for energy. In a report called Jobs for Tomorrow, they wrote, the creation of new skilled jobs can be achieved in parallel with a considerable reduction of energy consumption through, and this is their term, prolongation of the useful life of materials and products. Stahel and Reddy Mulvey called this prolongation reconditioning, and they had in mind repairing and tuning up cars, as well as renovating and adaptively reusing buildings. Furthermore, the report emphasized that the jobs created by reconditioning would be fulfilling meaningful ones for the workforce. So Stahill and Reddy Mulvey's line of thinking itself was not new. Of course, all accounts of industrialization involve an increase in productivity due to machines taking over the labor of humans, which basically translates to machines consuming energy to do work instead of humans and animals consuming food to do work. But at the same time, it was refreshing for Stahill and Rede Mulvey to suggest that this trend could be actually selectively reversed through humans taking back some of the work from machines. Although this was not new, this articulation was certainly influential, and Stahill eventually extended it into the actionable mantra that we all know well of reduce, reuse, recycle, also to the concept of cradle to cradle and to the framework of a circular economy, all of which inform our current understanding of climate change at the building scale. So on the one hand, we might draw on history. And at the same time, uh, in this kind of discussion, we might also draw on science. As this audience probably knows well, in the fall of 2018, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a report that was both familiar and unfamiliar. It built on facts we already knew about climate change. Carbon emissions cause warming, which causes sea level rise and extreme weather and loss of biodiversity, which in turn causes disease and hunger and migration and human death. But it also reached a new conclusion. The world has only 12 years to halt carbon emissions and avoid the most catastrophic global effects. The warming target of 1.5 degrees Celsius rather than 2.0 degrees is required, not optional. 
The difference of half a degree dramatically improves our odds of preserving any coral reefs at all, avoiding the collapse of insect life, escaping the trigger of irreversible planetary transformation, and minimizing drought, floods, extreme heat, and poverty for hundreds of millions of people. Urgent and unprecedented action is required, not eventually, now. But most importantly, in this context, we should think about design. So we should think about history, we should think about science, but we should also think about design. And the contribution of this series, as Andres was describing, the contribution to the discussion that's already taking place at GSAP and elsewhere is to start from the practice of architectural design and kind of build out. Advanced studios at this school have a unique opportunity to address climate change at the scale of the building and to address climate change through design. And with this in mind, we've invited an amazing and diverse group of speakers to help us explore these topics today and in our next session later this semester. Some of the questions we might engage include, how might buildings be designed with the scope that extends beyond a single site, client, and moment in time? What are specific and actionable methods for addressing carbon footprint, biodiversity, and social equity? What are the best ways to balance quantitative and qualitative factors in design? And perhaps uh, also, how should architects design in a context of increasing uncertainty? As Andres mentioned, this is a session that's meant to be a kind of working session. We encourage a lot of participation from the audience. Um, and um, I will now, uh, after kind of having given an overview of our thinking behind these, uh, this uh, series of events, I will introduce our very first panel and we'll jump right into the presentations and discussion. So this first session will involve presentations from Ginger Krieg Dozier, Nicola Dellen, and Julian Chopin. In this session, we'll address climate change at the scale of the building by looking at building materials. We'll look at low embodied energy, low uh, embodied carbon materials, as well as materials that are grown from living biological organisms. And we'll also look at strategies of material salvage and material reuse. Our first speaker is Ginger Krieg Dozier. She's co-founder and chief executive officer at BioMason, a new startup company utilizing natural biological processes for growing cement construction materials. Biomason's products make it possible to manufacture in ambient temperatures, enabling savings in energy costs and uh, zero carbon emissions. Krieg Dozier has over seven years of business experience working with a diverse team of scientists, engineers, architects, builders, investors, granting agencies, and strategic partners. Her background includes sustainable material development, from prototype to commercialization and environmental architecture. Prior to founding BioMason, she worked as an assistant professor of architecture at the American University of Sharjah in the UAE and North Carolina State University. Um, I've known Ginger for several years, been inspired by her work, and it's a real personal pleasure for me to welcome her to present today, Ginger. Thank you so much, David, for the warm introduction. Uh, first of all, thank you all for, for joining. I know this is an audience that um, is primed and ready to you know, discuss you know, the conditions of climate change in a summit type of setting, and I'm happy that I'm able to be part of that conversation today. So I want to start with this line, um, following uh, David's uh, introduction of you know, where we are today this is a line that wakes me up every morning. Um, it's, it's definitely something that I feel uh, is, is amplifying. And what this line is, is from NASA. So uh, the, the climate group at NASA, they're you know, doing everything they can to measure just how much CO2 we have in our atmosphere right now. And you, know, you can see the line is going off the charts. Um, you know, it, 411 parts per million. And that's what, that was in January. And I, and I can assure you that it will continue to go up um, after that. So for me, this is, you know, it's, it's an ever driving sign of motivation that we need to be able to find a way to flatline and then go down uh, from this incredible um, 
problem that we have with, with actually uh, what I believe is a, is a resource that we can utilize, uh, carbon dioxide. So we're going to have to science the shit out of this, um, essentially, <laughs> uh, and take in, uh, you know, Matt Damon's words from The Martian, but um, you know, there's, there's not a silver bullet answer to, to what's happening with CO2. It is going to take a lot of different technologies and brains together to really figure this out. Um, but I do believe we are all up for the challenge right now. Um, the 19th and 20th centuries were the ages of chemistry and physics. Um, many advances were, were happening at those times, and as you can see from the data, all, a lot of you know, population growth was happening at the same time, and the drive to build materials, do different types of technologies, were all reliant on our understanding at that time of chemistry and physics. And it's been said recently that the 21st century is the age of biology. And I, I highly believe that because I do think that, um, you know, if you look at uh, just bacteria themselves, only uh, less than a thousandth of a percent of bacteria have been discovered. So there are several, you know, just looking at one fragment of biology in terms of the microorganisms, there are lots of potential and opportunity for different types of learnings and technologies that can be embedded and gained and gleaned from that. Um, biotechnology, just as a, as a sector, is, is ever growing. Uh, there are lots of advances made every day um, in the field, whether it be in um, how we grow food, fertilizers, um, all the way to uh, what I'm going to introduce is uh, a way to grow materials. So. My background is in architecture. Um, I, I view the world through that lens uh, from very early on. I, um, from, from early, even in school, I, I went to Auburn University for my undergrad, and I had an opportunity there to do a lot of design build um, with Samuel Mockby. He started the Rural Studio, and it, what was incredible about that is that um, you know, there, there was a, a drive to make things, to do things, not just talk about them, but actually, you know, physically get on the ground and, and build. So um, that's, that's where I started from. And then after that, um, I, I worked for a little while, and then I went to graduate school at Cranbrook Academy of Art um, and started to explore different um, ideas around material. And right before I went to Cranbrook, I, I had moved five times. And I had all these different possessions, and each move I realized I was losing more and more of these possessions, and they were just saddled onto me. So when I was at Cranbrook, part of my exploration there um, were, it was looking at materials that would dissolve uh, when you were done with them. Um, and then it started to lead into uh, different types of materials that were about performance and looked at porosity. So ways of, of actually embedding intelligence and in building materials that had something to do with a sustainable focus. So for example, uh, materials that had a high, you know, high insulative value, they self-heal, they absorbed pollution, all, all of those ideas were very early um, in that. Uh, what, when I left Cranbrook, one of the things that I took with me was, um, you know, that this next step, what, I, what did I want to really look at next and spend a considerable amount of bandwidth on? And I had just finished reading this incredible book called Biomimicry, uh, written by Janine Banius, and she goes through the book and she lists um, different examples of scientists and how they're learning to make different materials um, by studying nature. And this book came out in 1997, but it's still so relevant even today. And throughout the book, I remember reading about um, marine environments and marine structures and that we still haven't figured out how to make glue as strong as a barnacle. Um, so a lot of these you know, topics were, were starting to be discussed. And so one night, I was, I was actually doing an internship in New York at, at Over Architects, and I was sleeping on the floor and thought, I want to grow a brick. So that's where, that's where my, my mind started in terms of trying to figure out how, how can you grow a brick. A brick is a ubiquitous um, form of construction. It's, it's very easy to understand. Um, it's, a, it's a modular unit and a platform that really started to embed a way of you know, trying to tackle a science within a certain form. So this slide here, what, one thing that I, I want to mention is um, We've, we've had a lot of advances in terms of stone and masonry types of construction over the years. And, you know, if we just look at the very beginning, I mean, stromatolites are an incredible 
uh, material that is biologically created. It's the, one of the oldest um, biological fossils that's a stone-like um, material. And then we moved um, you know, into clay brick. Uh, so we started to take uh, dirt and clay and add fire and have a strong and durable material. And then stone masonry happens, uh, which in some cases replaces or um, enhances uh, the, ma this, the brick masonry construction. And then we, we invented Roman concrete, and then we forgot how to do it. Um, so there's a period of time that you can see between Roman concrete and Portland cement, which was invented in 1824, uh, by the way, in someone's kitchen, which is incredible. Uh, and that started to change everything. Uh, you had populations that were increasing, everyone's you know, moving to an urbanization you know, levels. Um, you started to have reinforced concrete, so construction could get much higher and more dense uh, within that. Um, and then I, I just lead here that in 2015, we had our first um, installation of a biological cement. So in looking at these different materials, you can see that we've had some severe impact uh, from that. This is a stone quarry. Um, the stone doesn't replace itself. It is a finite resource. Uh, then going into bricks, um, over 800 million tons of CO2 are released every year from just the clay brick industry. And that's simply because you're taking, you know, a, a well, actually you're taking agricultural land uh, and converting that into um, a material that becomes inert but you're using uh, such a high energy source to be able to do that. Um, and then lastly, cement. What's interesting about the manufacturing of Portland cement is that you start with calcium carbonate, which uh, comes from limestone deposits, likely biologically created. And you take that and you burn it at high temperatures just to get the calcium and you release the carbon. So for every pound, of Portland cement that's produced, you have a pound of CO2 that's emitted from that. And concrete, as widely used as it is, is the second most consumed substance on the earth following water. And recently, a report from the Chatham House in June of 2018 mentioned that it was responsible for 8% of global CO2. The last number that I recall reading about just how much CO2 was being emitted from the production of Portland cement was 5%, and that came from Columbia University. And now it's 8%. So why being less bad is not good enough? So in terms of architectural materiality, you're looking at you know, your, your bricks, your concrete, your stone, there are certainly ways that you can make things better. Um, I call them Band-Aids. You, you can you know, try to find a different uh, supply of energy. You can, you know, some, some manufacturers are taking tires and burning those instead of uh, using fuel, which you have more problems even from that. I don't think it's, I don't think being less bad is, is good. I think you're, you're not addressing the real problem of what's happening. You have to go to the molecular understanding of what you need that material to do and how you can make it better with different supply chains. So, Biomason has a, has a different vision. Um, Biomason started in 2012. Um, I was teaching architecture at the time and I was doing this research of trying to grow a brick in my second bedroom. Um, and once I started to get things working, um, I had a big decision to make. And that decision was to stop what I was doing and put all of my efforts into getting a company off the ground because I believed it was the best way to make the impact as fast as I could. So at Biomason, we have, um, we're, we're very ambition, ambitious, but we have a vision and mission that really looks at finding ways of replacing the way that we make materials, in specific cementitious-based materials. So looking at nature, this is a, a beautiful coral. Um, it was something that w was quite intriguing to understand, again, you know, looking at uh, some of the work that Janine Banius is doing, but when you start really getting down to how the structure of coral, which is a, a strong and durable cement that's made at ambient temperatures underwater, it doesn't hurt the surrounding environment. In fact, it helps the surrounding environment in terms of how it's produced. And one of the things that I learned when um, I was researching how, I wanted to understand, well, how, how is this possible? How do you, you know, how does 
how do these different geometries take place? How, you know, all of those make a lot of sense in terms of how it actually performs as a composite material. And what I learned was that the coral, uh, as it's growing, has a symbiotic relationship with a microorganism. And that microorganism is what's possible for allowing a, if you think of a 3D printer, a small, you know, laminar templating of just where the calcium carbonate crystals are starting to form. And so, you know, again, think of it like a 3D printer and you start to get this type of, of arrangement. Fascinating, um, simply because it, it's something that um, is, is, it's a place for us to start. It's a place for us to try to understand how, not just how we can mimic this, but employ it. So what we do is, is we literally grow the cement with um, bacteria. We use a um, natural organism that comes from a marine environment. Um, we partner with nature, which is one way that I, I like to describe it, to create the strong and durable cements, similar to coral reefs. And we form them uh, with the building blocks of calcium and carbon. And carbon is sequestered into the calcium carbonate. So it was important for us as we're going through this journey, and you know, from an architectural perspective, it's truly trying to understand how we can um, mold and shape these different supply chains together. So we believe our cement is revolutionary and not evolutionary. We're not taking something that currently exists like Portland cement, just trying to make it better. We're trying to just do it a different way, a better way. Um, and so what, what's different about bio cement as compared to Portland cement is that you can predict the strength of that. It has an engineered performance. It's three times stronger than a concrete block. We do have some development where we're actually getting much higher than that. Um, and it's produced in completely ambient conditions. And that was very important for, you know, you're taking a biological system and making it, um, you know, work in a condition that it wants to work within. And there aren't any CO2 emissions. Um, so something that's, that's unique about how this works, and I'm gonna go through just quickly, just catch up to speed on how this takes place. But what's different is that you're creating a structural lattice between grains of aggregate itself. So this is a very basic overview of, of how, how it works. So we take an aggregate base. We, we, use, um, we try to use as many byproducts as we can. Um, but you can use natural or, or waste or high performance aggregates. And then those get mixed with bacteria. Um, everything is, is really developed around an existing infrastructure of how we currently make cementitious materials. So, um, we use the same type of mixer that you would use for concrete, and we use the same type of press that you use to make concrete blocks or bricks. Um, once the aggregate is mixed with the biologics, it, it goes into something that's a little bit different than what you would do with a normal concrete block or, say, a, a clay brick. We put it in a growth chamber where it's almost like hydroponics, where it gets fed a solution of water, which can be non-potable or seawater, and a calcium source, carbon source, and a nitrogen source. So we're essentially feeding it um, and recirculating uh, that mixture over the material, and then between 48 and 72 hours, the final product is complete. Um, the reason why it, it ranges between 48 to 72 goes back to the engineered performance. So um, if you're trying to make applications that need to meet certain specifications that have a higher strength, that's where the time um, equivalency comes in. And it's the same composition as natural stone. So that's something else that's important for us is that we're, we're essentially making limestone or sandstone um, within that. Um, this is what it looks like uh, under the, the microscope when it's growing. So, you know, you can start to see those structural lattices starting to form and how that behavior of the cement is engaged with the aggregate particle. Um, we call this a progressive cement as opposed to a one-shot cement. So if you're familiar with concrete and have had made anything out of it, um, you know, you hope you mix the right amount of water because once you mix the water, you start the catalytic reaction and you start to have the hardening process. Because this cement grows progressively, you can actually take, it's, it's, it's a lot stronger because you're creating those structural lattices and it starts to become more dense, essentially. Um, as it's growing. Oh, and something that's interesting about this, and we're fascinated by looking at these images, but um, you can see the fossils of the microorganisms as well. Um, and also, 
you know, in this lower portion here, you can start to see rings of how um, this grows over time. Um, so something that over the past seven years that, that we learned, you know, we started with, with bricks. And there's certainly a large market uh, for bricks and, and pavers. But what we realized is that this is more of a platform technology, that there are several different applications that can be made with this. So, you know, started with pavers, we're doing tiles and bricks. We're also doing things like dust control. We're also doing um, marine cement that self heals. Uh, we're moving into mortar and then ready mix concrete. So we're trying, you know, to not make a one-to-one -one replacement for materials, but we're trying to see just how many different applications that this technology can start to do. Um, as, a, as a company, and, and just as a way of thinking, cost, quality, scale, and life cycle analysis are what govern a lot of our decisions that we make. Um, so just in terms of cost, you know, clearly we couldn't make something that was you know, prohibitively expensive um, to use or, you know, for us having that um, impact as a goal is very important, so the cost had to be low. Uh, the components are activated by water, which is also very important for when uh, we work with partners. Uh, quality, uh, things that we're, you know, we're still learning all the different aspects of the material. We test them like NASA all the time, but we realize that they retard water absorption. Um, the installation methods are the same, and that's critical. For, for any, two, any new material coming to market, it, it, you can't change everything. <laughs> So you have to find ways that it fits uh, within a, a paradigm of installation and, and skill sets. Um, the color and texture can be customized. Uh, they can be made lighter than traditional materials. And they um, exceed the performance. Um, and again, that's, that's something that we found uh, to be very important about just how we approached new materials is that they had to be better. They couldn't just be green or sustainable. They actually had to start um, competing on the triple threat. Um, scale, they don't shrink during manufacturing. This is a little technical and highly um, specific, but concrete and clay shrink uh, about between 8 and 10% uh, during manufacturing, which can pose a lot of problems uh, just in terms of how they're installed. Uh, we use the same equipment uh, for production that you would use for concrete block or brick, and the process is automated. And in terms of life cycle analysis, so this is uh, the biggest governance that we have is that it sequesters carbon. Non-potable water can be used, and that's very important uh, for us, just in looking at a lot of different regions around the world um, where clay and concrete are, are widely used. Uh, you have to use potable water. And in some cases, that proves to be very difficult. Uh, it's produced in ambient temperatures. They can exhibit self-healing properties. And the raw resources are waste. Um, so just going through some, some quick history, this was our first pilot plant. We realized we had to be the first ones to do it um, if we're going to do something that we can train other people um, how to do. So our first plant was, was a lot different than our current production. Um, it, it, you know, a lot of it was, was taken from the hydroponics industry. Uh, we, had an, uh, we used that plant to produce uh, different orders. This one in particular was for um, paving in San Francisco. Um, which is the image here. And right now we're focusing much more on tile. Um, it, we, we can grow different shapes and sizes, but the tile really started uh, to come about for us as a way to engage a much more broad audience and much more wide use of application. So these are some images of our production. Um, we're pressing these units out. They go into curing. Um, so you can see just how they're arranged here. Um, and then the other thing that we do a lot is we have to measure CO2. So I believe my time is up, so I will leave it on um, that, which is that I don't believe that there is a silver bullet for, for different ways of making material, but that we all have to bring our technologies together. Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna have one more presentation and then a little bit of a discussion here uh, up at the table. Encore Hero was founded in 2001 by Nicola Dalen and Julianne Chopin. The firm works at a range of scales, 
on buildings, installations, games, and exhibitions. Winner of the new albums of Young Architects in 2005, the agency has designed and delivered several cultural buildings, both public and private, including a concert hall, a cinema, a museum, and an innovation center. In 2014, the architects curated an exhibition at the Arsenal Pavilion in Paris on the theme of the reuse of materials in architecture. In 2015, the agency won the design concept for the Paris site for COP21 and subsequently created the Pavilion Circulaire an experimental architecture demonstrating a variety of reuse possibilities. Since 2016, Sebastian Amard has joined the firm as a third partner, and the team is now composed of about 20 architects and is developing about 15 projects throughout France. So continuing our theme in this panel of materials and material possibilities as they intersect uh, climate change at the building scale. I'd like to welcome Julian Chopin from Paris. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much for your introduction. Um, here in, in Paris it's uh, 8 p.m. Um, and I'm still very happy to, to be here with you today by Skype. Um, um, it's an experience for all of us uh, and I hope the sound and the view will be okay for you. But it makes a lot of sense for me. Uh, in one way, I was very proud to be invited by such a great university as Colombia to talk about climate issues, to share with you our experiences. But in another way, I couldn't forget that my flight would have a huge impact around one ton of CO2. And so to solve that dilemma, I decided to stay here in Paris. I don't want to blame anybody, but I want to try for myself the consequences of this kind of decision, and I must confess that it's not easy to self-limiting. I went twice in New York, and it's really an amazing place, especially for European architects. I remember when I discovered the city, after Ryan Collard's book, Delirious New York, and so inspiring. But actually, in France, uh, we have around uh, 10 tons of CO2 by person for a year. And if we want to respect Paris Climate Agreement, we need to be between two or three tons. And this tone we avoid by doing this Skype, this video conference, is finally maybe the easy one. Of course, in our work, we are trying to develop low-carbon solutions, but I think we also must experiment directly what reducing means in all the other parts of our lives. So, I am Angela Chopin, architect, one of the two founders of Encore World, and we, we started the office in 2001 with Nicolas Delon, my partner, at the at the left uh, on the picture, and now we have 28 people. We have different activities uh, as art installation, public buildings, and research by creating exhibition and writing books. And for this presentation, I would like to explain you how we get into this reflection about reusing materials, and I will show you one exhibition and three projects we made. Everything starts by, uh, with a trauma 12 years ago. We were designing a temporary art exhibition for the French railway company in a train. And we made a specific design with nice materials. There was, there were plexiglass, mirrors, nice fabric. And after three months, at the end of the exhibition, everything was destroyed and became waste and garbage. The materials were in really good shape, but nobody cares, and it was not a question for the client. Even for us, because nobody asked us to think about that, and we were focusing on doing the best projects. We didn't imagine 
that the material should have another life. And so we try to keep some stuff, but we discover this big mess and we were very disappointed. So the first experience we did in reusing materials was for the project called Petima. It's a floating building on the scene in Paris. There is a concert hall with some folk music with a restaurant on the terrace on the top. It was built in a shipyard near Paris. We reuse all Bastel to make floating gardens on the terrace. And Petit Bain means small bath. It's a kind of joke to play with the name of the place. Forty Bastel were collected during a housing renovation. This was the, the building where the, the Bastel were coming from. The first job was to paint the outside in white and design a wooden basis. It wasn't yet really architecture, but it was our first experience on reclaimed materials. So five years ago, we had a chance to be the curators of an exhibition in the Pavillon National, as you, as you said, the Architectural Centre in Paris, on this specific topic of reusing material. It's called Matagrid, which has a double meaning in French. In one side, it means the dark side of the materials, the grey part, with pollution. And on the other side, it means intelligence. And the idea was to be clever to see the waste potential. potential. We thought it would be confidential, but this exhibition was a real success and welcomed 100,000 people. There were two main parts. The first one was very dark about depletion of natural resources to build, and we used some simple tools to express complex ideas. For example, we used iconic buildings models to represent the world metal consumption around 2 million of tons each year. It means the same as 20 Eiffel Towers each hour. We wanted to show our global footprint focusing on materials as sand for concrete or copper. The second part was very positive, with 75 examples from all over the world showing architectural experiments at any scale and for different type of programs. The first idea was to focus on our double line a big depletion of resources and at the same time a big amount of waste. And maybe with reclaiming and reusing could be a, re a response between these two opposites. The second idea was about urban mining. Just recognize that our today's buildings will be the material bank for tomorrow, tomorrow's building. The third idea was on historical lesson. In the past, reclaiming and reusing materials was not an exception, but was a rule, the main way of building. So we don't need to invent something completely new, but just come back to reason. And the last idea was a cocktail, the material mix. In order of preference, we should use first organic materials, of course, wood and all the other natural ones, then maybe reclaimed, then recycled, and finally fossil ones. And maybe the, the organic grid we, we just uh, saw before is on the top. To go forward after this exhibition, the first arch architectural project we did with this principle was a temporary pavilion called Circular Pavilion, built for a UN climate conference in 2015 in Paris as an example of circular economy in architecture. We first worked on a harvest map to collect different elements, lighting, wooden doors, conglomeration, chairs from waste collection, insulating panels from a warehouse in renovation. This is the wonderful doors, 80 years old, on site, 
ready to be used as a facade. The chairs left in the street by the Parisian in one month. We fix that and paint them. And this is the building site near the Hotel de Ville, Paris Hero. We are in the very center of Paris, near Notre Dame Cathedral. And we wanted to design an iconic building as an, a manifesto. This is the project complete with a specific facade. And in this case, the shape of the building itself comes from the material. We don't, we don't wait for ideas falling from the sky to design the facade, but our architectural conception is a reaction. And the shape of the material itself helps us to design it. Inside there is a space mainly white, and the wall panels came from all exhibition as a floor. At the end, 80% of the wall construction are from reclaimed materials. The second project I want to show is a permanent installation in public space called Passage Miroir. We are still in Paris. You can see the ideal view of the periphery, so the big highway around Paris. And since few years, the city of Paris experienced citizen vote to make projects for the people. And one of them was to design something under this early bridge where you can find in the weekend a kind of, of legal black market because we are very close to Willetus, which is the big free market in saint -Ouen. We propose the idea of the passage like uh, and the uh, reinterpretation of typical ones described by Walter Benjamin. There was wood, colors, and mirrors. And this is a simulation of the same project in the weekend with the black market. And then we ask the garbage men to save mirror panels. And this is the result of two months collection. We store them in our office and cut them to the right dimensions. And we prepare the construction. And this is the final result. And with the, the market. And the, the aim of this project was to afford dignity to these people who live from what they found in the street. And in a way, we wanted to use the same method to make architecture. And this is the, the passage by, by night. And the last project is the one we are working on, called La Grande Halle in Colombelle in Normandy. Um, the site is now on industrial wasteland, unoccupied, and there was this uh, amazing concrete building, and which will become a cultural center, co-working space about circular economy. And we are keeping one part as it is to host different events. The other part are working spaces and a restaurant. And because it's a permanent public equipment, we work very really hard to convince and to get all the permissions to re reuse materials. We develop a specific method to follow the material trip from deconstruction to our building site. In this project, we get a part of the budget to organize the collection of reclaimed materials as doors, wood bins, radiators, insulation panels, windows. And for example, this is a wood story with the old house in Caen, the big city close to the site. And there is the deconstruction time, there is transport and reprocessing. And finally, the integration in the project. And another reason for the facade, where we wanted to reuse windows, and this is a black frame in the picture. And we use the same method. First, you must find, and then you have to redesign your project to adapt the dimension, but 
Unfortunately, just before the construction, all the windows were stolen. It was a very hard time for the team, but we didn't give up. And last year, we started by building a small temporary space to welcome workers and have meetings during the construction. And here also, in these small buildings, all the materials are coming from around. And if we don't have any other troubles, the building will open next September. And maybe to, for the conclusion, uh, because it's, it was our last experience, and if some of you guys have the chance to see it, uh, we were creating the French pavilion this year at Venice Architecture Biennale. And this is the, the building of the French pavilion. And as, as you maybe know, there is alternately architecture and art. And just before us, the French Ministry of Culture asked the artist Xavier Leon to design the pavilion. And this project was called Studio Venezia. And he, he built uh, this wonderful real recording studio to invite a lot of musicians to play different kind of music each day. And all was made of wood in a kind of total design. And as on the evidence, and because it's very difficult to transport materials in Venice, we end it is as artwork to rebuild a new space with the same materials to create our exhibition. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, for that, uh, one of the one of the questions that I um, immediately came up with, with you know the approach that you have in terms of you know the reuse of these different materials, I was just curious a, a little bit about you know one, it's not the easy road. There are a lot of decisions that have to be made to figure out you know the best approaches to cut those materials down or or um, you know reorganize them. How um, how for you have you felt uh, that information needs to be translated or communicated to um, the in installation process itself or the construction process itself yes it's a, it's a good question because because it uh, because uh, uh, this kind of method change the process we do architecture because the architect is not uh, uh, can't decide all the process and he must uh, follow uh, and he must um, uh, start work with the the workers themselves, and not be the one who has the idea, who has the drawing, and say, "Okay, you must do, you, you must do that." Uh, when you are reusing materials, you are uh, you must be um, okay to deal with uh, something you you don't know, and you must be open to. Uh, um, to what happened uh, because for example the, the windows we, we were ready to to build with the windows and maybe uh, the, the windows were stolen so you, you just have always to readapt and to and to and to to be to be okay to to change your design uh, I mean just in the impact that your decision not to come to New York was a carbon-based decision um, how uh, this approach that you have of, of taking uh, this completely different resource to build um, buildings and construction with, have you seen that also translate to uh, an education of additional firms or additional architects of, you know, you guys are pioneering, I, I would assume, and finding these different challenges along the way? Is that something that you've noticed uh, any kind of uptick on, or is that something that you're concerned or, or interested in? Uh, uh, you, you, mm, you, you want to know if it's uh, something that the the young uh, the young architects are, are um, understanding? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think uh, young architects are, are just uh, you know it's a it's a huge uh, new supply chain. Uh, a yeah, yeah, yeah. Potential yeah. supply chain. Yeah, but uh, I think. Um, um, we 
there is no choice uh, because uh, because as you as you mentioned uh, we are uh, we must uh, focus a lot on uh, on low carbon uh, solution uh, your your uh, approach is a, is a natural uh, carbon uh, uh, solution with your with your brick and uh, and I think that's why I, I show the material mix and to say, okay, uh, I think reuse it is not the solution. For, uh, for me, uh, organic materials are the solution. Uh, they they must be the the, the main uh, the main uh, option. But uh, we have so many waste and so many garbage, and so I think maybe if we if we take a small percent of this uh, all garbage. Uh, maybe we can uh, we can build some some very strange architecture, and that's also a, a point. I like uh, what kind of architecture uh, we are um, we invent because we use this kind of materials. And so it's maybe it's it's also a cultural approach and not only uh, ecological uh, approach. And I think it's. Uh, um, you are uh, maybe your your um, your uh, att attention to biology is the same uh, is the same thing. You say okay, we must uh, make bricks di different uh, differently, but we also need to to focus on biology and just to because it's a cultural uh, a different way of looking at uh, at the world and not only physics and resources, but just the the uh, the vivant, the, the living, living, living stuff. I, I don't know if you if you get my my point. I, I do, I do. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if you if you heard David's uh, question right before um, your presentation, but uh, I thought it was a, a very in, intriguing question because there's this notion that you work to have something that's a today solution or a drop-in replacement. Um, and meanwhile, also thinking about what's next, you know, the, mm. the pushing uh, of, of wherever these new technologies or different technologies uh, can go. I was mentioning that Portland cement, at least to my understanding, was not uh, necessarily meant to replace something by one to one. It was you know, mm. intended to make something better. It was cost prohibitive and, and expensive and kind of ridiculous to constantly cut stone out of the earth. So this idea of having a liquid stone changed it changed a lot. I mean, it changed in terms of how we were able to build uh, buildings much taller, uh, you know, reinforced concrete, mm. you know, et cetera. So um, I thought that question was 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 quite key just because I, I, I feel like it is the question of, of where we are today, uh, a, a lot of us, you know, of here's what we can do today, <laughs> but really this is what needs to happen. And these are the steps that, that need to, to happen in between that. By the way, I loved your cocktail drawing um, of, of the different material choices. I, I also, um, I think that the way that your work um, and the way that you communicate your work are incredibly engaging um, to a point where uh, it becomes a, a, a metric in terms of how decisions are made, but also it's, 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 it's super easy to, to understand and I will be thinking about that. Uh, the material cocktail drawing for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was for us. It, it, it was very important to to find the the, the right way to to speak to people, mm -hmm. and and it was uh, very impressive that when we when we start to to work with reusing materials, maybe the, of course the politician uh, understand this this fact, but also the workers understand it very very well because uh, because they uh, it's it's like just a reason it's like um, it's like very uh, very simple to, to understand that that it's uh, it's a, a nonsense to um, to throw away uh, materials and also in the history we 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 always uh, unbuilt the building to build the, the new ones so we, we, we just need, need to, to come back to this simple uh, aspect of uh, architecture. Agreed. Okay. Um, 
maybe I, I'm also very uh, uh, very inspired by uh, Rural Studio from uh, uh, with uh, the work from Samuel Samuel Bogby. Uh, I don't know if if you know this this guy in 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 US who who develop a lot of uh, work with uh, with uh, reusing materials. And maybe for us, it's a, it's a very uh, inspiring work. I, I don't know uh, what is your your kind of inspiration if if to to develop your idea to to grow a brick. Um, so I I think it comes comes from two different places for me personally. Um, one is the uh, you know uh, reading different books, but also. Uh, yeah. one, of, one of my favorite stories is about Bill McDonough um, when he was teaching uh, a graduate studio and he walked into the classroom and he uh, brought in a pizza and the students, you know, and he ate this pizza and they're waiting for the syllabus to come around. And finally at the end of the class they said, okay, well, are you going to give us a syllabus? And he said, this is your syllabus. You need to find out where everything in this pizza and on this pizza came from. Uh, so they, uh, you know, and what a way to start to really think about it and break apart just how materials uh, are, are made and, you know, all the yeah. things that you learn about how many trips of tomato, you know, had, had gone, yeah. all the coatings and the cans. I mean, it was, it was quite incredible. So that was one of the inspirations is a different way of uh, challenging material, um, trying to understand it uh, to the molecule, but also the supply chain side. Um, and then the second is uh, I am highly fascinated with uh, shells and, and coral and took that mm. approach very early to, you know, this childhood wonderment of how, how did this happen? <laughs> you know, how does this work? So um, mm -hmm. I feel like after some time researching that, that was, that was definitely an approach too. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how do uh, architects... Uh, um, work with your with your materials because you, you show you show some some very um, uh, um, some very the picture was uh, details and some small uh, uh, do you have any any architects who say okay I love your brick and I will I will build a, a special project for it yeah so so right now um you know, we are doing different demonstrations. We've done some demonstrations in the past and sales just to get um, architects and, and builders familiar with the materials so that we can gain uh, the feedback, uh, just as the voice of the customer or user is important. But um, this year we have quite a bit of demonstrations that are happening um, to get the product out into the world, uh, but also uh, getting some of that feedback. Some of the feedback that we have received thus far is that it is very easy to use, mm -hmm. that it didn't change, you know, just in terms of how you yeah. installed it. We invited uh, different masons to come and, and work with the material and didn't tell them it was grown, <laughs> but just, you know, wanted yeah. to see yeah. uh, their impression. Um, you can construct things faster with it. There's some of the performance characteristics enable that. Um, but we also felt important to not just rely on the chemistry or biology of the material to set it apart, but, you know, try to find other ways of making it easy as possible to use. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, the shapes are important, um, all, all of those things. And, you know, we're continuing to get more feedback and, and iterate from that, too. In my mind, um, what both of you are doing is a kind of new definition of sustainable architecture. Um, it's not the it's not the the old version, but I wonder if we still have to deal a little bit with the old version. In other words, do you feel in your work that you have to deal with a kind of backlash or a suspicion against green architecture? Are you is is it on your radar that there's like a a, a reaction against you know do gooder hippie greenwashing these kind of terms? that um, might make people resistant to some of your approaches. So that's kind of part one. But part two may be more critical for me, because maybe we can overcome that really easily, is um, that clearly for both of you, carbon is critical. And you know, that's, I've been thinking about that a huge amount recently as well. Um, 
But how do you deal with the wide range of priorities from carbon footprint to labor, which you each both also mentioned a little bit, um, uh, to aesthetics and obviously many other things, but let's just think of maybe those three. Um, and do you think, like, can we and should we design solutions that have them all? Or do we really need to, to prioritize? Are there some tough choices ahead? Um, do we have to draw the line somewhere? For example, Julian, you're drawing the line at travel, you know, at least in this case. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and, and do we um, you know, have to make, have some trade-offs? Do we have to start being comfortable with saying, like, actually, we can't have exactly the kind of um, carbon footprint we want. At the same time, we're having exactly the same kind of labor conditions we want. At the same time, we're having the exact kind of aesthetics. Are we going to have to make some hard choices and, and be honest about not just being able to solve it all with hard work or creativity or technology? And do you, do you engage that? Are you starting to draw the line yourself? I mean, I imagine as soon as you draw the line, you're subject to a huge amount of like yeah. criticism, but, or, you know, objections. Mm, yeah, of course, of, 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 of course. Of course, it's very hard to, to draw the line exactly. Uh, because, and, and you, you know, I, I said it was a, the first time I, 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 did, I did this kind of, uh, of decision to say, okay, I want to come, I want to come to share with you, but it's not right. I, I mm, it's not right, and and so uh, and in architecture, it's it's a kind of uh, of the same, and maybe um, for your to to respond to your question, uh, maybe I, I think uh, we want to we want an architecture uh, which is. Uh, um, I think the, the aesthetical problem is uh, of this kind of uh, architecture with uh, reused materials. It, it's not a, a real problem because uh, because the the pavilion I show with the doors is very uh, demonstrative, is very uh, iconic, is very aggressive with uh, something very very strong. But we we also uh, de design projects where you you can't see. This is uh, old materials, and so I think it's uh, the architect must um, must uh, define his own architecture with dealing with this kind of materials. And you can uh, build you can build with reused materials without uh, saying it, because uh, sometimes uh, nobody can 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 see it. So. Um, this is to to the aesthetic uh, point. Uh, now, maybe for the for the job and to and for the the different uh, priority, um, I think of course uh, carbon is a, is a main uh, is a main issue because uh, because it will have so so many so many disasters. But uh, what it what uh, what it's interesting in reusing. Um, when you want to reuse, you have to you have to engage a lot of work to to because it's very easy to to throw away and uh, but when you when you want to deconstruct uh, uh, it may it uh, it takes a lot of time and when you want to to restore to repair and then to to rebuild with it takes a lot of time so I think this uh, this method need uh, a lot of workers. And so it's a kind of, uh, of course, ecological um, solution, but also a social uh, uh, solution. On the, uh, it works on the on the two on the two aspects, and and also uh, I think it uh, it produces a kind of architecture um, which is which is more human in a in a sense because it's it's more. I don't know you. You don't know exactly the the result when you start. It's maybe like uh, like when you make uh, when you cook when you make a receipt. You sometimes you, you don't want to follow the the receipt exactly, and you want to 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 to, uh, to improvise. 
Yeah, I love that. And and it could it was clear that the the workforce, the labor, yeah. the human conditions of the labor itself and the humanistic output, you know, was was evident in your work. And I can't help thinking, but you know, we we probably don't have time to go into it now about the kind of yellow vest protest. You know, mm, yeah, 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 of in course. That context, of course. you mm. being, you know, there in, in Paris, um, but also Ginger. I mean, you you employ people in your company. I mean, I guess many architecture firms also employ people, but you know, you're thinking about employing more laborers. The typical definition mm -hmm. of laborers. I mean, how do you balance those things? Yeah. So, um, you know, because of the multidisciplinary nature of this, it it takes a lot of uh, uh, brains and uh, points of of departure to make a lot of these decisions that that we make. So we have to have that multidisciplinary approach. Um, I think your the questions that you asked. There's there's something really interesting about uh, the question that sustainable architecture, that any kind of backlash that you might get from that. Um, I think something that. Um, I've, I've heard a lot, uh, even from the beginning, is how conservative of an industry construction is, how um, slow it is. And I think that there is this um, continuation of that thought that happens, um, continues. And I don't, I don't, I think the, the quote, you know, if you believe you can't, you're right. I think that's something that that if we continue to perpetuate that, you know, then obviously we'll, we'll continue to, to be slow within it. Um, the other thing that you asked about the, the, the wide range of carbon or, or ways that you can focus and prioritize, um, I feel like that's a, it's a daily battle. Probably is, it's a daily battle for all of us, but um, you know, for us it's uh, commercialization versus R&D. Uh, you want them to butt heads, but you, you know, they, they have to both have uh, equal voices and, and clarity. And I think the other the other thing about um, priorities or trying to do you know everything, trying to have something that solves all these problems, um, you're going to end up with nothing if if that happens. So um, I have to go to simple quotes, but Henry Ford, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. Um, I think that is another uh, very important thing for us because we're architects, and we, I mean. You, you should see our, our galleries and, you know, the galleries we don't show other people. Um, but there's a lot of experimentation. You know, you're trying to learn about a material, trying to understand its different colors and options. But for you to go out and make impacts or put the line in the sand about here's how much carbon we as a company need to save this year, you have to limit the options. Um, you have to educate your, you know, uh, um, customers about, you know, gray, it's beautiful. Here's, here's dark gray or light gray, which I think it, it, it makes sense. I mean, it's something that is uh, an important focus, but I think that it's too easy for things to move around for, you know, um, one idea to fold on top of another. So drawing that, that line in the sand, at least for us, has happened in the material color option. Well, thank you very much, uh, Julian and Ginger, for these presentations. Uh, since we're, we're trying to also uh, uh, see what's the, what's the impl implications of all these discussions, uh, acknowledging that probably uh, climate change and, and being part of this is uh, kind of shaking all the categories in which our uh, knowledge is based. Uh, so uh, there's a need to, to rethink many things and to, to change the way. So I, I would like to do four questions that are very much focused on kind of traditional lines of criticality in architecture. The first has to do with aesthetics. Uh, and it, it goes, Ginger, to this last comment that you did uh, on how to educate uh, clients on uh, footprint or things like this. And it's about uh, how do you uh, evaluate carbon uh, emissions throughout the process? Because this is something that is the main argument in both presentations. Uh, but it's not easy, actually, to know uh, the embodied energy, for instance. We have David Benjamin, who has extensively written on that. It's very complex. Or to know how much energy is required to paint a chair, to collect it, to, to, to place it again, to uh, move it afterwards to another place. Like, it's something that is, it, in, 
excludes some sort of complexity. So, uh, and that's a question about aesthetics. How do we sense this? How do we use uh, languages and, and sensitive or sensing tools to, to, uh, to deal with this collectively? The second has to do with another very, very classical line of criticality in, in our cultures, which is capital or markets and the notion of growth. Like your practices are, I understand, are, are commercial practices as well as many other things. So I, I, I think that it would be very important to know what, in what way uh, what you're addressing is also challenging the, the economy. So the way that you become part of the, of you see yourself uh, uh, characterizing economies and uh, your practice in regards to them. The third one has to do with uh, regulations, and there's a huge discussion on policies, and your practices are also challenging uh, many kind of legal and normative frames. Uh, for instance, I, I, I'd love to know what, what, what is the uh, liability of play, constructing with old doors, or for instance, what is the way that you deal uh, ginger with uh, the, the risk of uh, ex investigating or kind of doing research and on the and the last one has to do with with uh, the paradigm in which we are departing from the culture of resources and we're acknowledging that there's a need of an environmental reengagement and that is a question about otherness and uh, post anthropocentric approach to the definition of otherness uh, and something like very basic that is probably a question that comes to you like do we have the right to ask bacteria to work for us? Uh, and that's something, for instance, in the exhibition of uh, cooking section that was open, that is a question that is open, whether there's a right among humans to ask trees or to mobilize trees to, uh, to, uh, to get rid of our carbon. <laughs> so these four questions, one about aesthetics, the other about uh, market, the third one about regulatory frames, or legality, and, and then about a kind of otherness at, as, as in, in a post anthropocentric uh, uh, perspective, uh, maybe could also help uh, seeing how different your practices are and what is that that they're pointed to. So that, you know, that's definitely how for us the, the whole question started. You know, for us it was why do we have the right to go heat, beat, and treat to get our materials? Is there not a better way to do this? I mean, this, this is absurd. Um, and I think uh, just in where we are today, in terms of making decisions, we've, we've had to go through um, a, a little bit of markets um, as well, of looking at when would we run out you know, of the, the nutrient that we use, or the calcium source that we use, or the, you know, you know, the aggregates that we use. I mean, these are, these are questions that are quite important because you need to have the understanding of at what scale, like how much CO2 can you actually avert with this. So we, we've set targets for ourselves. We did a 50-year forecast of, um, you know, we have different iterations and versions of the process, and each version is a better version of the initial version and starts to utilize different supply chains um, within that because really it, it, you have to be able to measure um, that impact. And it's, it, it's a lot, you know, of, there's a lot of challenges and changes, and to do a 50-year forecast is, is very challenging in and of itself. But um, I'm going to laughingly answer one, one question about uh, the, the rights of using biology or, or bacteria. Um, I think that uh, from, our, from our perspective um, on this is that, you know, um, we are using them as an energy source. Um, we feed them well, which sounds funny, but um, they have a good life. They really do. And they, they make a big difference. <laughs> but, I, but I do think that there is, you know, it's a good question because you can start to look at when, when do you start to exploit biology the same way that we've exploited our natural fossil fuels. I don't feel that our, our minds are there or that it is a one-to-one -one relationship on that, but rather... Um, you know, being mindful of use, being mindful of how much of something actually needs to be present. So for us, that's, you know, we have a life cycle analysis as part of our four pillars as a company. So <laughs> we have to answer um, those in, in, in those ways. Um, yeah, so I will, Julian, I will, I will um, stop talking so that you can, <laughs> you can say something. Okay. Maybe maybe on on regulation. 
maybe it's a, it's a, it's a main uh, main uh, main problem for us to to deal with uh, with the the idea of the risk uh, using this kind of of materials and in fact what we discover is that we we have just to just to uh, to have everybody around the table uh, just to 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 look at uh, what is not a, a problem in fact and uh, we we just have to um, to look at the difference uh, the different insurance of each part of the process the the clients one our insurance were worker insurance in fact it's it's only a problem of uh, what is the risk and if you look at there is uh, there is a uh, it's it's never a risk, but uh, who want to look at if there is a risk? Because uh, when you do architecture, uh, nobody cares about the risk, and nobody uh, f uh, finally uh, look at the risk. And uh, when you are you reusing materials, um, uh, you must look at the risk because uh, because uh, always. Uh, um, always, someone is, is saying to you that uh, you can't, you can't do, you can't build like like this. And when you look at the real risk, there is no one. So, uh, so in fact, uh, we solve the problem by discussion. Um, after maybe the the question about uh, about uh, um, market or ec economy, um, uh, I think we we want to uh, to um, to show that uh, degrowth could be uh, an issue and uh, and it's not and it won't be uh, an horrible world if we are in degrowth and we want to we want to say okay uh, um, or maybe that uh, maybe we are uh, already in degrowth and we we just need to to accept this fact, and then to to say okay, we will have to 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 deal with less material, less energy, less less and less. And so, uh, if we have less, we can have uh, we can have more of I don't know human relation. Uh, we we need to invent what will be more uh, more of what uh, because we will have uh, less of many things. I, I don't know if, if it's uh, if it's clear, but uh, this is uh, this is uh, um, what we are looking for. I wanted to thank very much uh, Ginger and Julian. Um, thank you so much for being here with us and starting off our conversation in this way. Thanks for having us. And now Ziad will um, make a comment and then move into the the next uh, panel. Yes. Hi. Thank you, David, and thank you, Andres and David, for the organizational effort and for inviting me to participate. What struck me, and this is not really not a critique and maybe more of an observation, is that when we were looking at the history of the cement and concrete, I, I couldn't help but notice that, for instance, the Ottoman cement was not, uh, or concrete was not part of that historical conversation. And my question is really about I don't have a question, sorry. My observation is really about how much history I think we need to still uncover before kind of keep also moving forward. Uh, cement, uh, Portland cement in Lebanon, for instance, at the beginning of the 20th century has radically transformed the construction industry from masonry into concrete. There's a difference between Ottoman, I'm not also an expert either, but the Islamic architectural practices used smaller stone, bigger, thicker uh, uh, grouts. So there are many differences, and I'm wondering if we also need to somehow enrich our historical knowledge as we kind of learn to move into the future. But anyway, uh, so my name is Ziyad Jamal I am happy to introduce our second panel today, titled uh, Timber Building. Uh, and I'm going to be introducing both uh, speakers. Our first speaker for the second panel is the Architectural Office Ultramodern. Ultramodern is an award-winning architecture and design firm. Located in Providence, Rhode Island, the office is committed to creating architecture and public spaces that are at once modern, playful, and generous. Ultramodern has experience working at a wide variety of scales, from single family residences to urban scale planning. Their clients include the Van Allen Institute, National Park Service, Chicago Parks District, among many other governmental and cultural institutions. The work of the office has been published both nationally and internationally and has won several awards, including the Architectural League 
Prize and Architect Magazine R plus D Award. The office has also won the Chicago Lakefront Kiosk Competition in 2015 and the Central Falls Affordable Housing Competition in 2017. Ultramodern was recently recognized as the next progressives by Architect Magazine. The office is led by co-principal Aaron Forrest and uh, Yasmin Vobis. Vubis. Yasmin received her bachelor's degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and her master's degree from Princeton University, where she was awarded the Butler Traveling Fellowship and the Susan Underwood Prize. Uh, Yasmin has also worked in the offices of Guy Nordison Associates and Stephen Hall Architects. She has taught at Princeton University, Rhode Island School of Design, and she currently teaches at the Cooper Union. Yasmin also received the uh, Rome Prize in Architecture 2016-2017. Aaron Forrest receives both his bachelor's degree in ma and master's of, uh, in architecture from Princeton University. He's an assistant professor of architecture at the Rhode Island School of Design and prior to RISD, Aaron taught studios at the University of Pennsylvania and Princeton University. He has worked with Bernheimer Architecture, Guy Nodison and Associate, and in Madrid with uh, Habalus Herreros Architectos. Both Yasmin and Aaron were designers in residence at MoMA PS1, the rising current chariot and exhibition. Our second speaker uh, via conference from MGA office in Canada is Natalie Talawayak. Natalie is a principal at Microgreen Architecture, an award-winning architecture and design firm, uh, creating engaging, sustainable, and innovative projects. Their goal is to produce a meaningful and sustainable change in building through innovation, construction, sciences, and design. Based in Vancouver, Canada, their projects ranges from small installations to large-scale international development. Their design promotes the health and wellness of the community and engage with the surrounding environment. MGA also promotes the use of wood and new technology, extending the boundaries of timber construction and timber technology. Um, the office has completed some of the largest modern building, uh, timber buildings in the world, including the Wood Innovation Design Center and T3 Minneapolis. MGA has received numerous honors, including three Governor General's Medals in Architecture, the highest distinction given to architectural projects in Canada. With an education in both architecture and engineering, Natalie's approach is rooted in material logic. Combined with an emphasis on cross-team collaboration, Natalie is driven toward solutions that marry structure, systems, manufacturing, and architecture. Her career highlights include work on the award-winning CLT construction, Ronald McDonald House in Vancouver, and the Mass Timber Multi-Activity Center in Sweden. Um, so this would be the end of the introduction, but before I hand it over to the uh, presenter, I just would like to end with a brief, perhaps, observation on the topic at hand. At a time when architecture is starting to seriously and perhaps somberly uh, question its impact on the environment, as introduced by David at the beginning of the session, wood has emerged or maybe re-emerged as one of the most sustainable, renewable, organic building material mobilized by practices uh, like our speakers today to challenge traditional knowledge of timber construction techniques, pushing timber construction norms, its spatial and structural and tectonic capacities, and in turn, pushing our understanding towards architecture and its relationship to nature, uh, nature as both a place for, uh, as, as a place for physical resources, in this case, replenishable resources, and as a physical environment as a whole. Both our speakers today have contributed to this emerging practice with equal degree of innovation and radicalism, recasting architectural typologies with wood, at the, at the intimate scale with large gestures, as in the case of Ultramodern's work, uh, while also demonstrating its scalability into the larger architectural and urban scale, as in the, is the case with MGA's work. So I'm looking forward to hear further about that and more from our speakers. Please help me welcome Yasmin and Aaron, who will be followed on the screen by Natalie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ziad, uh, and also David and Andres for uh, inviting us. It's great to be here and to be able to be part of this uh, very urgent and very interesting uh, conversation. I also have to say that we're very excited to be uh, in conversation with uh, MGA. We've been following their work since before we uh, ever saw a piece of CLT in the flesh. And so it's, it's, uh, we're just very excited to be able to, to discuss our uh, commonalities with them. So we're gonna actually start off by talking about a project that's a little unusual for us in that it's purely a, a kind of speculative proposal. 
Um, it came right at the end of a string of uh, uh, wood projects, uh, some of them built and others uh, that remain unbuilt. Um, and there was this moment when we got a, a call from uh, the editors of, of CLOG to participate in an exhibition uh, that uh, they were organizing and they asked us to uh, design uh, what, what they called an investment tower. And this is a phenomenon that's very familiar, I think, especially in New York City, this idea that these apartment uh, buildings get built um, and are filled with condos that then become a kind of investment vehicle uh, for the ultra wealthy, um, but, uh, but uh, are essentially left empty. And so you have these kind of big empty towers that uh, represent a huge expenditure of, uh, of resources but are actually uh, essentially unused. Um, and so knowing the kind of sustainability logic of mass timber, which can kind of lead you to this strange uh, and extreme conclusion that building with more wood leads to actually a smaller uh, carbon footprint, we uh, kind of joked, well, all these people are just bu buying these uh, abstract volumes of, of space up in the air. So wouldn't it be just as good if they were going to buy a big cube of wood somewhere up in the sky? Um, and so uh, we... Um, we basically proposed exactly that. This giant wood block uh, of unknown breadth and height in which uh, real estate speculators could essentially buy shares in it while simultaneously sequestering at least some of their uh, carbon output. Um, so what started out as a kind of innocent uh, fantasy then became more and more serious. First of all, we needed to think about egress, so we uh, threw in some fire stairs. Um, and, uh, but since no one was going to live in there, we figured the stairs could be used as a kind of public promenade uh, through the building. And though the primary experience of the building would be this kind of sheer mass of wood, we opened up a few uh, gaps in the tower in order to give the public a kind of breather as they climbed up. And so all of a sudden the stairs took on a kind of structural role uh, to keep the gaps open. And, and um, uh, these gaps became this kind of space for uh, views that helped kind of orient the experience. Um, and so reaching the top, the visitors would be uh, rewarded with this kind of new observatory on the city. And Though the, um, the design was entirely fictional, we began to see the tower now quite seriously as the embodiment of an approach to wood architecture that we, we've been working on for a few years now as not only a kind of new sustainable material that we're compelled to use to reduce the carbon impact of construction, but as a kind of catalyst for new forms of public space and indeed for architectural production itself. Um, uh, if anyone in the booth is listening, we can't see the slides on our little monitor anymore, um, but I'll keep going. <laughs> um, so uh, so the, the title of our talk is actually taken from uh, an essay by Siegfried Krakauer called The Mass Ornament. Um, and uh, Krakauer w uh, was kind of uh, observing this cultural phenomenon of the late 1920s where these traveling dance troops, uh, such as the Tiller Girls, pictured here, um, were expanding their numbers and dancing in these kind of large-scale geometrical configurations where the kind of coordinated body parts would dissolve into this kind of sea of, of, of human matter. <laughs> um, and he was critical of this, but at the same time saw it as a kind of a symptomatic condition um, of uh, uh, that was really a challenge to the art and architecture of the time to uh, to come up with new art forms that could address um, industrial society and these kind of larger scale publics uh, that were very new in cities at the time. And so at the same time, engineers and later architects began kind of experimenting uh, with what were then new materials, steel and concrete, uh, to create larger and larger scales of architecture to address these new publics. And these experiments were studied and published, you know, they, they kind of drew the interest of uh, the um, kind of architectural in intelligentsia of the time, particularly Siegfried Gideon, who uh, was very interested in the kind of new heroic forms that these materials made possible, but also in the kind of lifestyle and the qualities that they could bring to architectural spaces. 
And these are two of his publications from the time. And in this context, uh, something as mundane as uh, flat plate concrete construction became the most exciting thing possible. It was like a manifesto uh, for the new, the new architecture. And this is what every uh, residential tower in New York is made out of these days. Um, so today, in, uh, in terms of uh, timber architecture, we're still kind of emerging from our uh, tiller girls moment, I think. Um, <clears throat> we're kind of trying to find what, is the, what, what are the new forms that are made possible by mass timber. And a lot of uh, contemporary mass timber arch architecture is still kind of working with the forms of post and beam construction. Um, but these materials are, are much larger. They're theoretically infinite in size because they're made up of very small, small pieces uh, glued together. They're very strong, and so all of a sudden they, they, um, they allow a kind of wood architecture that can address the public in the way that it couldn't really effectively before. So um, with mass timber, we're kind of in search of uh, a kind of contemporary maison domino. And though we think it's not likely to come in the form of the actual Maison Domino, the, the, the point is the same. Building with mass timber is not simply a kind of technical problem or a sustainable solution, but it's a kind of fundamental question of aesthetics and form. What uh, new architectures does this material make possible? So um, we've done a few projects with uh, mass timber now. Uh, MGA has, has done many more. Um, <laughs> But uh, today we're going to talk about a few of these that really try to explore this idea of, you know, what is a new architecture made out of wood. Let's see. So the, our first foray into this kind of territory of mass timber uh, was with an installation up at the Boston Society of Architects called Four Corners. And to start out the project, we were really interested in looking at the history of New England uh, timber construction and specifically the way in which um, traditional timber barns are built through um, what are called gable, or gable bents or bents, which are these kind of two-dimensional frames uh, that basically get repeated in a linear fashion to produce the kind of space and architecture of the barn. Um, but we were interested in kind of thinking about a, a translation into um, new mass timber technologies. So um, thinking about uh, the bent as something that could be made out of um, CLT, cross-laminated timber, which means a kind of rethinking, right? That it can no longer be this kind of two-dimensional plane, but that perhaps it could be made out of um, a series of complementary corners, a series of kind of interlocking parts that then become sp stable through their kind of um, interrelationship. And so, um, just to go quickly through this project, the, while the installation kind of formally references, I think, the, the you know, New England barn, structurally and spatially, of course, it kind of turns the logic on its, on its head. Um, and we're also really interested in, in the kind of detailing of the project to really uh, have the uh, mass timber be the kind of, not only the structural material, but also the, um, the finished material, so any fasteners um, you know, would, would be kind of minimized. There weren't any kind of heavy metal plates that you typically see with um, this type of mass timber construction. So this project was really our, our start, our first test, and it gave us some ideas of how might one work with CLT, but it kind of also um, made us realize some other things that kind of led to this uh, proposal for uh, a lakefront kiosk in Chicago. Um, called Chicago Horizon, where I think we were able to take some, some bigger leaps because of that experience. So the, the competition was essentially for a, a, a little kiosk along the lake shore. And uh, in starting the project and in kind of researching the site and thinking about the project, we, we came across these two Chicago references. On the one hand, uh, Mies van der Rohe's experiments in kind of suspended, long span, uh, uh, roof surfaces such as at IIT, and then also uh, the Rain Charles Ames film Powers of Ten, which asks this really fundamental question about what happens to our understanding of things as we kind of jump in scale. So while the competition kind of called for um, actually a very small kiosk, we, we felt that working with CLT, uh, we could actually produce something much, much larger and more generous and something that could kind of give basically produce a larger public space for the city. Um, and so we reframed 
the problem of the kiosk not as one of, you know, how do you make the kind of perfect boutique little kiosk, but at, rather as one is how do you kind of make the largest, thinnest uh, kind of wood roof possible. And this meant a kind of like radical kind of um, simplification of things. So a very simple open plan that's supported, a big roof that's supported by um, a set of radial columns, uh, glue lamp columns, and then two small volumes below. And just to give you guys a sense, um, this, was, this was about the square footage that was stipulated in the brief, and so we decided we would try and take a chance and see if we could actually maximize that, that on a different scale. Um, but what's interesting to us also architecturally is that kind of uh, simplicity of that move also um, would lead perhaps to a kind of rich spatial experience so that below, underneath this kind of massive plane of wood, um, you might uh, look out to the kind of flatless, flatness of Lake Michigan and then up above that big plane would kind of reframe your uh, experience of the skyline. Um, and also, you know, thinking about the kiosk not as something, as, as a kind of self-contained object, but as this kind of thing with a porous boundary that would allow a different set of, uh, a number of different publics and activities to be kind of embraced uh, within it. Yeah, and so to, to really take on a, a, um, a project of this scale, we had to kind of keep the, the, uh, the material palette very limited. And so we thought we would just, we would just try to work uh, with um, just basically two materials, so a few others got added into the mix. One was uh, the CLT, which would form the structure, and then uh, um, chain link on the other hand that would become, uh, become the kind of uh, element that would be used to outline spaces. Um, and at some point in the project, we thought we should kind of do a comparison um, uh, of you know, all the kind of carbon emissions that came from various materials and those that got eaten up by the wood because it's harvested from trees that grow and sequester carbon in the process. Um, and it was very kind of interesting and educational experience for us to, to um, go through this spreadsheet that's, that's out there um, and available from the University of Bath where you can uh, quantify all of your materials and it tells you how much carbon you're consuming. Um, and then to, to, to kind of subtract that from this, this volume of wood. Um, and what was very interesting was that uh, in the context of this project, even with steel connections and all this chain link fencing and, and um, stone quarried from the ground, that the, um, the, car the total carbon impact of it um, was, was negative on, the, uh, on a kind of uh, ratio of, t of uh, uh, eight to one. Um, and then the idea was that these, these kind of few materials would, uh, could be employed in a kind of counterpoint to each other in order to create a kind of clarity of, of space. The CLT here is um, all of the horizontal structure. There's no beams above it or anything else. Um, so it's really just um, kind of paring things down to the structure in the space. Um, and in order to, to figure this out, we, we worked with a colleague, uh, uh, Brett Schneider, who's at uh, Gienorinson and Associates, who came up with this idea that we would actually use two layers of CLT, one on top of the other, in a kind of cross-hatch pattern that would then get fastened together in order to, to create a kind of uh, flat plate condition like you see in the Maison Domino. Um, and this was, uh, this sounded really simple, but it turned out to be super complicated um, <laughs> to figure out how to get uh, a one-way material like wood to start to behave like a, a two-way material. Um, and it really came down to, uh, you know, working with multiple concepts of the structure and, and um, how that informed uh, the way these things would be kind of fastened together. So on the left is, is an idea of the whole thing behaving more like a pure, pure flat plate uh, with these stress concentrations around the column. Uh, around the columns. On the right-hand side, this idea of these very wide, very shallow, flat beams in a kind of cross-hatch or coffered pattern uh, that would then uh, uh, kind of serve to support the rest of the wood. And it turned out that, um, that working through these two different ideas, the idea on the right was actually much more efficient than the idea on the left. Um, and so we ended up going with that one. And interestingly, uh, none of the form changed through all of this. It was only a kind of question of uh, conceptualizing and calculating the differences. Um, we also had to kind of think carefully about how this big monolithic plate of wood would get assembled. We'd been studying Mies van der Rohe, looking at the new National Gallery, and we thought, well, maybe they'll you know, build it on the ground and then lift it up on the columns. 
After much uh, back and forth with the uh, contractor, this turned out for safety reasons to be the best way to go, so they actually built it just a few feet off the ground and then kind of slowly raised it over the course of six hours up into the air. I guess aside from the wood, the second material that you kind of see in the pavilion is the chain link. And again, it's a kind of industrial, cheap material, but used as a, as a kind of architectural finish and, and structural material. So here, it's stretched between the kind of plane of the, of the roof and the plane of the ground, um, thereby kind of avoiding any kind of secondary framing that you would get at the corners. And so the, the intention is to really keep that space very uh, pure, very clean. Um, as well as you know the roof as well, looking back. Um, the other thing we kind of thought about is as a public space uh, was how do you kind of extend the life of the kiosk into the evening? And so we came up with a, a lighting installation of LEDs in, at the two different volumes of um, uh, one, one set of LEDs of, of cool, cool white and one set of LEDs of warm warm white that would start to have this conversation throughout the course of the evening and into the night that would kind of reward a prolonged attention. Um, and you see that here and here. Um, but I would argue that, I guess that at its heart, the project is really about a kind of abstraction, about really clearing the space for a kind of public to, ta to take it over. Um, it doesn't kind of wear construction on its sleeve. Um, and, you know, we, we really enjoy model, we enjoy shots like this because the, the project starts to resemble some of the kind of innocent physical models that we made early on. And so we, um, we're very interested in that kind of relationship of, of how do you construct a project that's, um, you know, that maybe uses a sustainable material, but that really tries to, uh, you know, there are questions of architecture and questions of, of what it means to be in the city that are kind of at stake um, as a result. So I think that's it. Thank you. So I'm Natalie at uh, Michael Green Architecture here in Vancouver, um, and at MGA, um, this is actually a photo, a photo of our Gastown office um, here in Vancouver, a uh, photo of our, our kind of workspace, which is actually a, a 25 foot long uh, piece of CLT uh, that as a, here's a photo kind of of our, our team here in Vancouver, um, you can see uh, kind of bringing that CLT panel from the, from the alley near our office through the through the courtyard and kind of into our office space in an old uh, 100, 100 year old uh, map timber building in uh, in Gastown and uh, for, for six years this is where we we have kind of worked as a team focused on map timber construction and um, actually from this we actually just moved our offices uh, about a month ago to another neighborhood and so we're looking for our even an even longer uh, kind of table to, to house our, our team that's growing now to about 35 people um, of architects and, and designers. And uh, kind of in addition to the recent move, another um, kind of change in uh, development that's really informed the way we think and we, the way we approach design is our uh, relationship now with Katera. Um, Katera is a, a technology company company ultimately, but really focused on reimagining and rethinking what is the construction industry and, and uh, basically a vertically integrated model from design all the way through fabrication um, and rethinking how we can um, kind of address needs of um, how do we create more quality at uh, a more affordable price and then ultimately what we're focused on is how can that then be part of this larger movement to impact and uh, sustainability and how we approach um, uh, kind of the use of timber material. Uh, the way that now that especially with this relationship with Katera, it's kind of really allowed us to think and focus our efforts in terms of uh, what kind of projects we take on, what kind of work we focus on, and that's kind of looked at about a 50-50 split between unique bespoke projects and what we we're calling our kind of typology projects. So those really focused on fabric buildings, where we live and work, and um, and kind of the, the, the at, at scale, really that's where we have the potential to really influence um, and really kind of start to move the mark in terms of uh, the climate uh, kind of change reduction. One thing that we have in common. Um, between this kind of 50-50 split of, of, um, of projects 
is really, again, focusing on um, using timber. It's something that Michael and I have worked together over the past uh, 10 years, um, and Michael kind of uh, past 20 years, um, really about that. And, and part of that is that not only is this such a great opportunity to sequester carbon, but also it's a material that has a an individuality. It has a, a unique kind of, each tree is, is kind of special and different in a way then it allows us as uh, to kind of connect to that material and value value not only the, the tree itself, but then the spaces and kind of quality of the, of the architecture from that. Um, and and kind of as we look at our body of work, we focus on these kind of three main um, kind of efforts. So material selection, certainly um, we, we exclusively work on, on kind of timber projects, which for a lot of reasons we'll get into shortly. But we also look at how can we create um, kind of a simple approach to kind of design that this kind of idea of long life loose fit, something that will respond to change, will um, be a building that can endure over time, that really, um, in a way, it takes this question of the kind of the cycle of, of, of tree, the cycle of how we as an industry look at really short building timelines like 20 to 30 years but how can we build how can we build buildings that are maintained for hundreds of years and um, become a really important part of our, our kind of built fabric so looking at again that idea of a kind of connection to a wood material something when we look at office space design that we've encountered quite a bit is um, the question of having kind of column spacing within um, kind of a workplace is that constant study, how can we create kind of an efficiency in layout, how can we create um, a space that people want to come and work and, um, and kind of are creative and successful, and part of that is that kind of connection to, to raw material, kind of understanding where this has come from and, and then therefore uh, kind of connecting back to that. So we kind of look at buildings from both the inside and then the outside, literally how can we connect those with the, the context, whether that be um, an urban context or in this case um, in northern Canada. Um, uh, this kind of link to where something sits um, kind of on the planet. So I think this has been framed really well today, and I, I, I appreciated um, both uh, all of the kind of um, discussion and and looking at again this, this massive kind of kind of task that we have as an industry to look at you know 48 percent of of our CO2 emissions from buildings, and it's something that um, this kind of question of how do we address this in in uh, kind of a timely timely manner, it kind of comes down to um, really what is this um, speed and scale of innovation, but also allowing allowing enough time to be considerate and conscious of what we build and what we build where. Um, and for us, again, it comes back down to um, kind of why mass timber, and just to kind of uh, describe when we say mass timber. Um, for, for those who might might be kind of asking, is we're looking at in a lot of cases a uh, kind of panel product. So from CLT, um, you can see on the top left diagram, it's kind of basically our, our larger kind of panelized um, uh, basically plywood that made by two by fours, and all the way through to nail laminated timber, dowel lamb, blue lamb, um, LVL. And I think what's really interesting now is you know these are the materials we're building with, but that this kind of um, opportunity to focus on even new ways of creating, um, using this kind of naturally grown fiber to create glueless opportunities, uh, to create even less uh, a kind of impact uh, by innovating through product design. Um, and then looking at our, our kind of our main drivers, and these are often kind of topics that we talk about at the beginning of a project or with different jurisdictions about. Um, the kind of the main kind of driving factors of why we choose to design in timber and the opportunities um, kind of for a project as we look at it. So it's certainly um, kind of on the theme is this kind of sustainable um, whole approach um, and how 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 um, we can consider both the kind of carbon sequestration but also the kind of embodied carbon relative to how these buildings are built and the and the, the processes in which they're they're kind of designed. So when we look at um, kind of our understanding of what we're building now, how does that relate to our um, kind of basically our capital cost of embodied carbon of the building itself versus um, our operational costs? And this is a little bit of an outdated graph, but the 
kind of trend to see as the kind of the building ages and the kind of the percentage of building energy consumption that can be tied to both either operational or or kind of embodied. And I think as we continue to, as an industry, um, kind of make really great strides in terms of operations of the building, MEP systems, passive house, how little um, energy these buildings can consume over time, it puts an even greater emphasis on what we're building now and what those physical materials are. And it's something that, um, you know, we don't, we don't know where this kind of relationship will end up, but we know to make change now, and as we look at where these two, these two lines cross or don't, it's, it's this kind of these questions and these, uh, these decisions that are made, um, especially for our fabric buildings um, with a growing population. So as we look at comparing um, our carbon footprint um, for uh, from concrete all the way through to kind of wood frame construction, again, kind of just illustrating that kind of story. And um, kind of taking some kind of graphic facts, so one ton of carbon kind of equals one uh, meter, meter cube of, of wood. And for us, looking at opportunities like the Wood Innovation and Design Center in Prince George, um, so this is an entirely, um, uh, it's a dry system, so it's uh, from design all the way through to completion. It was a 14-month process. And part of that was focusing on um, creating a solution that didn't rely on concrete to um, either achieve structural capacity or um, acoustics, which is often a, kind of a limitation and consideration uh, when we look at um, mass timber buildings. So 50,000 square feet academic and office um, space in Prince George, British Columbia, um, and really exploring the kind of opportunity with a simple building diagram. So you can hear, see here the ground level um, lecture space on the ground, ground floor. And again, kind of looking at that um, kind of construction sequence and, and how, how prefabrication and um, simplicity of the, the details can really accelerate um, the construction process. This is a, a diagram that shows, uh, illustrates the uh, construction assembly at the floor level. So here you can see that dry assembly, which relies on a buildup of um, uh, layers above the CLT to create your acoustic um, barrier. And here we we're exploring this opportunity of really staggering these CLT floor plates to, to integrate our sprinklers, our lighting, um, our conduit within that within that uh, chaseway, in a in an effort to marry the MEP systems, the structure, and the architecture um, that together would allow the, the kind of celebration of that, uh, that kind of material in its truest form. You can see through the, the building section, um, the intent was to basically consolidate as much of that um, kind of complexity within the building core and then really allow the perimeter to kind of be simple and, um, and kind of expressive. An image then from the interior, um, interior of the building there. And through to the lobby where we used uh, LVL as our uh, kind of feature stair um, material, linking that through to an exterior canopy also uh, fabricated from LVL. And one of the opportunities with this, with kind of wood construction, is we look at really using exterior wood in areas that are um, highly protected and trying to be kind of respectful and responsive to that. In this case, we also explored, um, explored using. Um, charred wood cladding um, as a means of, um, of naturally kind of protecting that cladding material um, on, the, on the face of the building. These are also prefabricated um, exterior uh, wall panels, again, as part of that system to look at this kind of kit of parts that could create kind of a really efficient construction process. And uh, in terms of, we, we, we did pursue an LCA with Athena on this project, and uh, in terms of the amount of, of of uh, timber in the construction of this, this project. The, the timber itself could be grown by North American forests in four minutes. So um, kind of looking at that, at the kind of global impact of, kind of supply and demand, which we can get into shortly as well. And from, from that, so th that's kind of an, a local, uh, local to our province uh, project, but we're looking at kind of exploring this, these kind of opportunities all over the, the globe. So we have a, a project, and a really interesting project that I'll describe in uh, Yalbury, Sweden, um, all the way through um, to uh, 
number of projects in um, in the states, and certainly in uh, Minneapolis, we have our T3 Minneapolis project there, and and uh, working with Sidewalk Labs in, in Toronto on um, a, a kind of a really interesting customer opportunity there. And I think as we look at these kind of global projects, the question of how much supply do we actually have, um, and how how as a as an industry can we look at the cycle of this um, of this as a real um, uh, kind of intentional use of our master. But this is a diagram that that uh, describes the net change in forest area across the globe, and and you can see um, that with kind of sustainable forest practices, there is real opportunity to to kind of grow that. And what we're what we've been talking about a lot here is um, in, in terms of the, the position we're in, and even targeting two degrees, even if we could get to three degrees over the next century, the importance of not only maintaining the forest we have to supply enough um, enough structure, uh, kind of material for our structures, but moreover, how can we look at really planting so much more to sequester um, as a, at a kind of a global scale, um, kind of the amount of carbon that we are um, being faced with, um, and. And it's it's kind of well beyond kind of a one project, two projects. This is a, an approach looking at how how do we build what we build, but also how can we approach um, the kind of forest sector in a way um, that really does have that strong opportunity to impact the amount of carbon that we can sequester. Um, one of the studies and kind of uh, kind of fields of interest that we're also we also explore is this this kind of cycle of kind of forest to frame and. Um, and through that, not only kind of each kind of element and the, the kind of um, human aspect and the kind of connection to where our materials come from, but also looking at how um, how this kind of um, enthusiasm and focus can start to create innovation at every part of this process, every part of the kind of construction process. One of the kind of realities that we, as an industry, are faced with is, of course, how what is the what is the impact of cost, and when you look at a mass diversification, and it's it's currently um, it's quite variable. I think that it's a growing industry, and it's something where we can all see this potential of a more cost-effective um, approach, um, and a lot of that is rooted in um, opportunities for prefabrication. But currently, given kind of the rate of growth, it really requires all the different parties. Um, that are kind of experienced and involved to work together to build um, to build the industry and build the strength of um, of that, which then will relate to kind of further reduced costs. And a part of that cost kind of saving is is um, how we can save time on on construction sites. So looking at you know 15, 20 percent, it depends on kind of the strategy of, of, of prefabrication, but. Um, Really, kind of maximizing that, both in terms of um, carbon reduction, but also in terms of, of, of certainly kind of the use of those buildings, opportunity, how we can address um, kind of need, needs for housing, needs for um, kind of development at scale in a responsible way. So, uh, 18-story um, tower here in Vancouver, in Vancouver at University of British Columbia. Um, Looking at an 18-story structure that's erected in 66 days, so again, really maximizing that the um, kind of simplicity and amount of crane picks, the uh, the choice of what scale of, of the various elements um, kind of that are included into the structure to really be part of that holistic solution. And even looking at kind of construction sites, so at every scale of kind of experience from the finished building through design, the, the experience that it is to either work or work near um, a construction site, and and when we look at the scale of development, this actually the percentage of time that work is under construction is quite, is quite significant. And when you look at a, a timber construction site, you know it's clean, it's dry, it's um, it's relatively quiet, and, and in a lot of ways, kind of quite beautiful. And the largest kind of um, kind of bucket of interest here is. Um, is how we um, how does this impact the way that we live and work in our spaces? What what uh, what impact does that have have on our kind of our quality of life? So when we look at facts like ninety percent ninety percent of our time as humans is as an average is spent indoors, and um, and that can have a profound impact on on our well being and. So many studies kind of showing this kind of connection to nature and connection to um, that environment of how it can impact um, 
the reduced stress levels and improve healing times, but also kind of tests showing experience is, or living and our healing in spaces like this actually will um, kind of speed up recovery times and kind of that connection to, to nature in different ways. And one of the projects where we explored this um, this potential is at the Ronald Dodd House here in um, Vancouver. So this is at Women's and Children's Hospital. It's a house um, for 73 families. Um, and the intent is to basically link this building to the province of British Columbia, both in design and also in in kind of the way that the, uh, the kind of the materials and the kind of graphic, graphic wayfinding work. So the series of four buildings linked together by a central uh, living room and courtyard. And um, you can see here, this is a photo of the um, common living room uh, with two kind of flanking um, courtyards there with the slide kind of beyond. Um, but really focusing the energy and the um, kind of the quality of those spaces at the at the both connection to exteriors physically, and then also connection through to the forest of BC um, through that link to um, the kind of CLT panels here. This is Douglas for Douglas for um, CLT by Structural M in this case, and also um, using larger um, LVL tables throughout the space, and and um, and and not only impacting kind of. Um, the quality space for people to come together um, and also helping with um, acoustics in those spaces as well. Here you can see connection through to the um, to the kind of sunken garden, um, kind of a one edge as the exterior kind of comes through and, and really links the, the various common spaces together. Uh, the type of construction of this building is a balloon frame CLT project, so the, the lateral and bearing um, walls are CLT. Um, and the infills, TJI, TJI Joyce. So we're really looking for the right material in the right place. And, um, and in this case, um, part of the material selection also was related to a strategy of how we can build a building that will be easy to, easy and kind of um, cost effective to maintain for the charity, um, but also something that will provide a very solid and very um, kind of resilient backup for the cladding system. Um, here you can see through construction, the, the construction process actually sped up quite a bit through as we, um, after the first um, kind of house was built and the, the construction team um, kind of became more familiar with the process, it, it uh, ended up being, being quite um, kind of time efficient. And you can see here the connection through to that, um, that wood on the interior. So in this case we used an exterior um, brick cladding, again looking at this really long kind of lifespan. Uh, building and also something that could almost be like a kind of a solid shell that would protect and um, and kind of preserve that that wood uh, kind of edge and interior. Through the back, there's a kind of a, a play area that links through all the kind of common areas in the in the courtyards there, um, linking up through to the CLT dormers and uh, the adjacent um, public spaces into the dining room. And the common living room. And when we try to approach projects from the kind of small scale to the large, so these are actually playhouses that also double as a as kind of donor recognition walls that can be the houses can be moved around, they can be adjacent to each of the houses, or come together to create one um, kind of continuous playhouse. And um, these are actually built by a local school. Um, where the students learned about um, wood construction and um, kind of created um, the, these these houses as part of their classwork, and and uh, kind of coming back to this kind of story of, of forest to frame and this kind of connection from uh, a seed and how um, kind of natural processes and the material logic within that create that tree and create that life, and and again this kind of opportunity from within that of when you take that element and then create it, uh, kind of a fixed building, building piece, but still maintain that connection to where it came from, and as a kind of holistic solution, looking at um, the, the kind of community of people, both directly and indir indirectly, that are affected by the, that kind of process in the industry, and a project where that is. Um, it's kind of a bit of continuous discussion is at Oregon State Forestry School. Uh, this is a location focused on uh, different um, areas of forest resource management, ecosystems and society, and uh, wood science engineering. So really 
kind of a microcosm of the conversation of forest and forest management um, all within kind of one um, one kind of project. And this, this project is currently under construction. This is actually an image of the main atrium space that was really seen as the heart of the of the project, and the heart of kind of this opportunity for discussion and collaboration and really bringing industry, academia, and the community together to kind of discuss um, and really um, kind of push forward the industry. And one of the main themes of this project is transparency. So transparency both to kind of within the within the school to research what's going on, but also transparency literally to to kind of the connection to the um, adjacent landscape. The project is um, comprised of an 80,000 square foot academic building, so the, the shots that I was just showing you, and then also a, a larger, um, a taller testing facility. So this is actually a 35 foot tall space with a, a five foot wide reaction wall um, that acts as a, a laboratory for um, kind of testing and innovation uh, at the school. Both these projects are being completed next year. And, and um, again, coming back to where we live, where we work, why this matters, um, this is T3 Minneapolis. So this is uh, the opportunity of this project is taking cues from what is uh, so attractive and um, kind of appealing to old loft spaces, old warehouse spaces. Um, how can they, how can they are kind of so in demand and also create a really rich opportunity for um, kind of these places where we live. And, and a lot of that is, uh, in this project, focus on simplicity, raw materials, and materials that will get better over time. So in this case, it's actually um, kind of corten steel cladding, um, and then uh, nail laminated timber um, as the kind of the main um, floor spanning material. And these, it's it's amazing how um, how much of a difference it can make in terms of the success of a kind of a thinking space and a uh, a place um, that really impacts the quality of uh, kind of uh, our businesses. Here you can see an AXO, just kind of how the envelope there um, kind of connects back to the building, um, building a view from the exterior. Certainly focused on this kind of idea of simplicity and, and kind of timelessness and an effort effort to be resilient over time. I we really enjoyed uh, looking at the work and the kind of variety of contexts that you guys have worked in. I'm, I'm very interested in, like, you guys have done all this research on the, the kind of delivery method of, of wood and all the advantages that that um, proposes. And I'm very curious about a kind of evolution since um, you guys have been involved in, in uh, wood architecture for a long time. Uh, if you can kind of speak to uh, the way uh, the way the industry is changing um, from your earliest projects to today and how you're seeing a change there. And I think particularly the kind of integration of microgreen architecture with um, with Katera, like why is Katera interested in wood and, and what do they see that bringing to the table? Because that's, I think, uh, kind of explosion in orders of magnitude in terms of um, uh, that kind of delivery method and the focus there. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been interesting um, how the kind of the speed and scale of, uh, of change that we've seen from the case to Tallwood for Tallwood ten years ago until now. And I think one of, in a lot of ways, what the way the industry is working now is 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 rooted in a lot of the kind of smaller players. There's a there's a lot of these kind of um, specialists, um, but they're very siloed. And I think. Um, so this goes from even just in terms of separate erectors, separate material fabricators, separate um, kind of how the, the shop drawing process works. And even within the past kind of two or three years, we've seen a, kind of that starting to change as well. For us, certainly, that's in this relationship with, with Katera. Um, and I think what we're seeing is so many kind of folks, especially from the outside a little bit, so Katera coming from a technology background and looking at our construction industry and just seeing this kind of world of opportunity for how we could do this more effectively and efficiently. And part of kind of what we're trying to work through is, you know, how does design play into that? I think the opportunity for, um, for collaboration is so, is so 
present and um, and we're super excited for that process. But the um, mechanism in terms of how we, as a, as a kind of a collective, um, kind of get there, I think it's we're, we're in that process. But certainly kind of looking at the industry itself, it's, it is still comprised of kind of many, many kind of small, small players. And I think this is where for us, which is completely uh, interesting and, and, and uh, you know, I think there's a lot of merit to to that kind of focus from individuals. Um, but it's right now how we all work together um, in an effort to kind of achieve a lot of these same goals. Um, so certainly we're seeing things, a lot more kind of opportunities for prefabrication, the scale of, of what we can prefab is changing, but I think it's, it's all kind of that work of how do we collaborate together kind of right now. I'm kind of curious because I think, um, I mean, wood has been part of architecture for such a long time and I think it's used in, you know, in a real range of scales, anything from finishes to now to the structure. And I, so there's, I feel like there's this broad range from uh, projects that are striving to be kind of completely purely wood to projects that kind of are hybrids with other building systems. And I'm kind of curious about uh, where you guys think you, you're headed or if, if there is this intention, because I think there are projects, you know, where they try to remove all the fasteners or they try to remove all the steel and other components. And so I'm curious to see where you guys think you might be headed, if, you know, on yeah. that kind of spectrum. It, so in terms of um, in terms of composite materials and um, yeah, um, it's something uh, you know we we've discussed a lot and um, really looking at materials for what they do best. So composite materials is something that we are interested in pursuing in terms of you know when it makes sense to have post tension steel, for example. It's the Oregon State project actually has a, a self-centering um, rocking shear wall system. So it's basically comprised of CLT with um, post-tension cables that run the length of those walls. And um, the marriage together of those two materials creates a system that can be occupied post-disaster. It's something that's a self-centering system um, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons. And um, that's compelling. So I think that's just one example. But there's other. Um, Again, when we look at the opportunity for span and scale, and when it makes sense to introduce another material, um, you know, we're interested in pursuing that. Part of the kind of balance and what we're kind of looking at and reviewing, though, is how does that affect how this building could be deconstructed? How can um, how does that affect you know that certainly the car, kind of carbon story, but but really when as soon as those materials become um, con considered as a product or an element, it's what is that value and how are you impacting that the kind of the longer LCA of the of the entire kind of project so um, but overall as a kind of a, as a our approach we're certainly interested in looking at it I'm really interested in the question of like uh, wood hype like I think wood is just this it's it's a did you hear what I said wood hype like the hyping of wood like we we as architects I think have been kind of sucked into this industry machine of, you know, uh, basically the, the softwood lumber industry uh, who have built up this entire marketing campaign around wood. And I think it, it uh, obviously we, uh, we thrive on that to a certain extent. We're very interested in, um, in the kind of uh, capacity of wood for generosity. But I think there is a, there is a large amount of, of hype. There's no other way to say it, I think. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, uh, I'm very interested in the kind of life cycle diagrams that you showed that showed architecture as a kind of output of, of forestry management as a way of sequestering carbon. And I'm wondering, like, it, first of all, like, uh, do you think that's realistic? Uh, uh, and where does it have its limits? I think it kind of comes back to this, for, for us anyway, the, the scale of the issue at hand. and. Um, so kind of those that discussion of forest management globally, um, and I'm hopeful, and we're hopeful that it is it is possible when you look at the the lifespan of a building compared to the lifespan of a tree and the lifespan of of different fibers that are being um, pursued, you know, with less than a 70 year kind of life cycle. Um, but even when you map out, if you had a, a target of a hundred year building and there's a kind of a process for deconstructing or kind of reformatting that building over time, um, the map, you know, the, it still adds up when you look at a, a kind of a 70 year um, cycle, even for a traditional forest management. Um, 
And what we were really talking about here, though, and something that we, it's, it's such a massive kind of undertaking, but there, there is the hype, but how can we t best take advantage of that to plant even more trees and plant even more, like kind of reverse this in a much more kind of global scale um, and think past the building scale, think past that kind of cycle. But given just the, the kind of the bare bones of the math add up, we're really hopeful that this can be, that it can be effective and that it is true. Okay, great. Uh, hi, Natalie. This is yeah, nice meeting you. Um, we're about to open the floor for questions, but before that, if you just think, start thinking about your questions, I'm just going to ask both of you, make a quick observation, and ask uh, maybe one question that perhaps could be shared by both. First, I, I want to thank you for the really beautiful work that you presented, kind of inspiring process. What I really appreciated was also kind of the rigor in the making and the thinking process, always self-checking uh, kind of where you are in terms of the cycling of material, the movement of material, the, foot, the CO2 footprint, and so on and so forth, and then adjusting your process accordingly. So the, I think the self-checking is really becoming an important part of our practice, perhaps, and that, that can really across uh, in your work. Uh, but um, so the, my question would be uh, referring a little bit to the language that you used, which is, on one hand, you guys, Aaron and Yasmin, talked about kind of the repression of the details. And, and really celebrating the architectural and the tectonic quality as opposed to the wood as a material. And in your case, Natalie, I think you, you kept on also bringing up the simplicity of the details and the simplicity of the, the, simplicity of the details and the building the aesthetics overall in terms of the way it looks uh, spacious and flexible and so on and so forth. So the, I guess the, the uh, Mies kind of was the uh, elephant in the room, but in your case, it was really actually collaborator in one sense, kind of you were doing your project vis-a-vis -vis me's thinking. And halfway throughout the presentation, I, 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 I maybe I realized that maybe what you guys are up to is really correcting that kind of Misian universal legacy, but instead of using steel or, in, or, or celebrating that industrial uh, 20th century material, you're kind of now mobilizing a material that is much more um, environmentally conscious and you're kind of adjusting it along the way. Nonetheless, I think the Misian aesthetics were a part of your repertoire, and I'm wondering if you would talk more about that in the sense that at what point CLT becomes a material that doesn't resolve, that to say, the previous architectural repertoire, but becomes its own and then move into its own architectural, let's say, uh, language. Yeah, I don't know that I have a good, a good answer for that. I think that uh, one of the reasons that um, that Mies or Korb is interesting to look at in terms of wood is because they weren't, uh, I, I, I think both, neither of those figures was actually particularly uh, interested in the authenticity of, of concrete or the authenticity of steel and how those should be, uh, how those wanted to be expressed to use uh, Kahn's uh, phrasing. I think, so I think, uh, it, at some res in some respects, I think finding the proper the proper expression for CL for CLT or for mass timber may not be the right question. I think uh, for us, it's a question of there must be something different, <laughs> um, and how do we kind of how do we poke at the conventions of timber construction in order to find to find new ways and, and new forms. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know that I have a whole lot to say beyond that on those terms because I think it's a very, it's a very interesting question. I think part of it. I, I mean, it's certainly something we, we, we talk about a lot as well. And I think the innovations in terms of what these materials are and how they're made up. I think when you look at wood, that's a unidirectional material. That's a, all the fibers are aligned. And and as we look at something like a panel product, you know, that's where we kind of create in a sense something that's similar to how concrete functions. You know, in a two-way system. Um, but I think that as we look at what the small piece is, so at the scale of material through to what is that product, there's just so much opportunity and difference between one to the other in terms of the actual piece um, and how that can be informed by, um, by that linearity or that kind of unidirectional material. Um, you know, I, it's just, I feel like there's going to be, as the industry and as the kind of material logic evolves, and we kind of just get into this in more detail. I do think it's going to start to evolve, and I can't say how, but I feel like given the kind of the what's at the root of it, the potential is just so interesting. Um, so I have uh, two questions. One is um, if uh, any of you know uh, how much carbon is released when one tree is harvested. 
Um, and the second is that uh, I've noticed that in a lot of the projects, it's these kind of uh, slab typologies almost, um, and what's the potential to poke through them and have um, kind of different variations in uh, the floor slabs, um, kind of light wells, et cetera, some views kind of vertically um, with the CLT construction. I feel like that, that, that question about the emissions of a tree being cut down, we don't have numbers for that, so I was wondering if you did. I, I don't actually have that. I'm interested, but I don't know. <laughs> There's definitely emissions involved in the harvesting of trees and uh, transportation, fabrication, everything. It's, a, it's an industrial process like everything else. Um, I think in terms of the opportunities for uh, variation and form, are, it, it, I think they're there. I think, uh, I, I think Natalie showed a lot of, of examples. Uh, we showed maybe less so, but um, but I think it's quite a flexible material design-wise, and I think that's part of the opportunity. The, the uh, CLT especially has been used mostly in housing and hotels uh, in a kind of cellular typology, um, and uh, and I think as uh, as wood gets used in more uh, building types, you'll start to see much more uh, kind of design. Uh, innovation, for lack of a better word. In terms of how to think of more ecosystemic relationships between the built environment and the actual forest as a, as a resource, and especially, well, I don't know how many people in this room have been to a timber plantation, but it's quite scary. And in terms of monoculture, they, these trees are planted every 50 centimeters to one meter. They destroy the soil, they totally exhaust it, they displace indigenous populations from Eastern Africa to New Zealand to Canada to every place in the world. So I was wondering whether we could think, or the industry, or, or maybe in your experience, if you've seen any conversations within the industry to, to move beyond using trees as a resource, and maybe uh, think of these composite materials in the future as something that does not exhaust landscapes or, or the livelihood of many people, even if they are arguably sustainable uh, source, sustainably sourced, which is all these kind of there's been a lot of critique towards these labels that say that is um, sustainably sourced when it, in fact, um, maybe not so. Um, so yeah, whether the industry is also debating into sourcing timber from, uh, not from trees and maybe reusing other types of composites. Um, I think those are, I mean, those are excellent questions. So I was, I've, um, in past, my past life, I was a, a tree planter for many years um, and I think that there's two questions there. One, with what we're doing, is it effective? Is the policy and the, the measure of what is sustainable, is that effective? Um, but I think the reality of, or the potential to continue to um, look at how we sustainably manage forests is real. There are ways that are far more respectful and resilient to manage a forest that does maintain the integrity of the, of the environment, of the, the uh, it's a kind of through selective harvesting through um, when that's replanted and the, the measure in terms of the policy is something that needs to be further discussed and, and um, interrogated and questioned you know what makes sense but it, the opportunity is there for trees to be that source of fiber if we do it responsibly um, I think certainly though in parallel the opportunity for other fibers and other we, you know we're quite comfortable with agriculture and food food production as a at that kind of cycle and you know those are those are just a different type of fiber but um, in terms of replacing and, and looking at hey is, is actually this the the lowest carbon um, material source to look at these penalized products I think absolutely we need to kind of get to the, the bottom of that and continue continue to ask those questions um, but I think there is opportunity in both. I'm not a student, I'm a city councilor in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I came here for this conference because I'm intrigued at how we can change the building code and the zoning laws and so forth to incorporate the new materials and designs you're talking about and build the density that I think we really need to have climate change resilient cities. I think that's a, a huge issue. I think the, the discussion today is on uh, climate change at the building scale, but I think there's no question that there's a huge impact, possibly larger impact, to be had in the organization of, of cities, and there's a lot of, of people doing uh, important work on that. I think um, one of the challenges for, for
for mass timber construction has been the slow adoption of, of updated codes across municipalities. Um, and uh, you know, when we did the Chicago project, they are on a building code from 1982. So, uh, so there's they have no conception of what uh, what mass timber is. Fortunately, we're doing a one-story building with no enclosure, so it's not such a big deal. But as you get into the larger scale, that becomes a major challenge. Um, and so, I think as a as a member of municipal government, you know, looking at, at what the local laws are and what they allow and what they promote is, is an important thing to do on a regular basis. Natalie, anything to add to that? Um, I think uh, the approval of the stories with ICC has been a uh, kind of a massive uh, kind of step in that direction, I think, uh, to Ernst's uh, point, though, the kind of speed and um, I think consistency of how the um, New, newer um, code approaches are being adopted is something that we have certainly come up to across North America. The kind of the it's very uh, currently quite uh, uh, specific to the jurisdiction in terms of how um, the science and the kind of fire and uh, kind of material logic is um, is implemented. So I think uh, there again we're making a lot of good progress. I think some of the limitations are how again the speed at which those are adopted um, and consistency um, amongst how they're interpreted um, across, uh, you know, across North America. Thank you so much, Erin, uh, Yasmin, and Natalie. Thank you both. Thank you. Uh, now we have the, the last panel, uh, uh, which is, is bringing here another perspective, a perspective that is very much influenced with the tradition or by the tradition of uh, French and European political uh, this uh, ecological discourse, uh, traditions of territorial discussions, uh, uh, the, the discussion and the evolution of environmentalism in, in, uh, in philosophy, but also in, in, in the U.S. in policy making. So it's, it's uh, very much uh, a, a way of understanding architectural practices as something that is connected to geopolitical tensions and with the, the way different scales get articulated as, uh, uh, as part of the making of civil society. The first, uh, the first speaker, where I have lost my note. Yeah. The first speaker is going to be uh, John Palmesino, uh, founder of Territorial Agency. Uh, territorial Agency defines territories as the, as the complex set of relationships to things that keep us alive. alive. They are bound spaces where intersecting borders establish semi-stable relationships between politis and their material base of operations. Uh, John Palmesino is an architect and urbanist. Together with Anne-Sophie Ronstuck, uh, he founded Territorial Agency in 2007, an independent organization that combines architecture, analysis, advocacy, and action for integrated spatial transformation of, of contemporary territories. Recent projects include the Museum of Oil, that has become kind of an icon of a different way of, of thinking architecture in its relationship with politics and environmental issues. Also, a different way of practicing in which an architectural uh, agency is associated with an advocacy group like Greenpeace. Uh, and it's also understanding uh, architectural typologies as a political force to also close uh, uh, cycles, uh, political cycles. Uh, is also uh, the author of Anthropocene Observatory, the, Muse the Museum of Infrastructures and Conscious uh, uh, North, uh, and uh, Nishable Mark uh, Marker Mir, and Kiruna. Uh, he, uh, he's been, uh, John Parmesino, together with Anne Sophie, have been teaching extensively both in Goldsmith and in AA, where, where they, they had a huge impact and a huge influence in the way architecture is being understood and also uh, introducing research as a design practice and as a way to connect uh, architecture with politics. Uh, their work has been exhibited everywhere and uh, from the beginning with works like Mutations, uh, the Unstable States of, of Europe, uh, to uh, recent works that are starting to be uh, known and that uh, John and Sophia are working on, 
are kind of shape, uh, shape, shaking not only the way we understand the connection of architecture with uh, environmental issues and politics, but are also having a great, a great influence uh, in institutions that are difficult to be reached by architects. Uh, recently, John Palmesino presented a proposal to United Nations and is following up on a big project in which uh, they're working to redefine the way oceans are sensed and uh, the, the connection or the, 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 the way humans are the ocean uh, uh, can be conceptualized. Uh, following John Parmesino's presentation, uh, we'll have uh, uh, cooking sections who are becoming very well known here. Uh, and they, have, they just opened an exhibition um, at, at, at the Arthur Rose Gallery. Uh, uh, cooking sections is a duo of spatial practitioners based in London. Uh, it was born to explore the, synth, the, synth, the systems that organize the world through food. Using installation, performance, mapping, and video, the research-based practice explores the overlapping boundaries between visual arts, architecture, and geopolitics. Since 2015, they're working on multiple iterations of the long-term scientific climate war a project exploring how to eat uh, as climate changes. Uh, their work is, again, is uh, being exhibited uh, everywhere. Uh, recent projects were presented at uh, Manifesta 12 in Palermo, also in Lafayette Anticipations. They're presenting their work also in the Venice Biennial. They were part of the 14th Venice Biennial American Pavilion. Uh, they just released a book uh, uh, by Columbia Books as well uh, on the Empire Shop, a project that they've been developing in London and in different locations in which they're uh, looking at food and the way uh, it connects to environmental dimensions as a way to rethink uh, the history of colonialism and to re-situate uh, the discussion of uh, uh, post-colonialism and decolonizing practices as a material one and one that is environmental. Uh, following that, we will have again a 20 minutes conversation self-driven uh, uh, self by, by the, two, the two speakers. Andres, you're always too kind. Um, colleagues, uh and friends and members of the audience. I, uh, I'm gonna do uh, something that I usually don't do, and that is to start with uh, a list of stuff that we do. This is uh, uh, how I started thinking when Andres uh, asked us, choose one project uh, and go in detail about it. And I really couldn't think which one is not linked to climate change. And uh, this is just a, uh, a recent list. Uh, and today I'm gonna f uh, focus uh, on a little fracture, a little, little uh, part of uh, the Museum of Oil uh, project that is somehow the uh, moment that uh, somehow is uh, for us uh, a transformative project because it has uh, allowed us to think uh, of uh, negotiations as uh, the specific form of uh, architectural practice for us uh, in, since uh, we started Territorial Agency. So, uh, the Issue is very simple. No? Uh, this is uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, the uh, Global Energy Assessment, which is uh, a, a, an, in, an institution based in uh, Vienna, has calculated uh, the uh, human uh, energy use or yeah, transformation of energy. And uh, since 1850 until this is uh, the first energy uh, assessment, uh, but not as much has changed, we went from around 60 exajoules worldwide to 600 exajoules worldwide. This is the Industrial Revolution, and this is uh, the inception of the Anthropocene. Uh, there's not one single species in the history of the planet that has done such an energy transition. And uh, there's not one single species that has managed to uh, articulate uh, this uh, relationship between energy and uh, body mass at such a magnitude. The top line is, in the thickness of the line, is the renewable energy that we're using in the world. The rest is fossil fuels. There's a little bit of uh, biomass still uh, going on, almost untouched uh, since pre-industrial conditions, and that is uh, maybe another project that we have to do, but the rest is uh, only uh, fossil fuels. If we look at the, uh, these are uh, slides that we always show as a first step to, with our students. If we look at the same great acceleration, but in uh, percentage terms, we start seeing what uh, 
you might think is the tragedy of the commons. We, we tend to use one big energy source at a time. We move from uh, wood to coal to oil and maybe to renewables. And each one of these transitions is, uh, of course, a completely different organization, a political organization, or to say it clearly, political organization means a transformation of the city. It's a transformation of the city which is an architectural practice. Each one of these energy shifts has been a major architectural practice. You go from small cities uh, surrounded by forests to large organizations of industry, industrial cities to the international, to the contemporary uh, conditions of oil, which we might call the globalization city. And renewables is this highly unstable anxiety of trying to get out of it. What happens after the, uh, the Cold War is the Warm War. We move from the... Uh, idea that war simply vanishes and we are now in deep war with ourselves. Today I'm going to show you a little fracture of the Museum of Oil, which is a project that we started with uh, Greenpeace. And it's a very simple project and uh, it connects the sky, what we uh, talk about, the atmosphere, with what is underground. We connect uh, somehow the muck of oil, uh, the uh, dirtiness of oil, with the beautiful clouds and blue sunshine uh, skies uh, that characterize our life on the planet. The question is really what happens in between. And uh, in between, something like this happens. So you start seeing large organizations like Greenpeace uh, or like other NGOs, individuals or major cities or even states, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, starting really to deal with uh, this major transformation that links what is underground with what is in the sky. And how we do it is nothing else by, than sensing. What we are trying to uh, articulate in this little uh, 20 minutes uh, presentation is how we start seeing a very strange architectural phenomenon, and that is that measuring uh, the way of uh, surveying and acting on the big transformation is nothing else than an attempt to understand those situations. In a, in a way through which we uh, try to make sense of the world, but it's also intercepting the most sensitive part of the Earth. And uh, this is what uh, I would like to articulate today. So this is a problem. Uh, we have a... Uh, Greenpeace, major organization with uh, millions of uh, subscribers, having to organize these kind of uh, uh, missions, uh, very dangerous missions. This one is in the Arctic. And, and uh, every part of the world asks them, do this, do that, do this, do that. And the actual organization of Greenpeace is not that big. And so the Museum of Oil starts as a conversation with uh, our friends uh, in London of Greenpeace in order to make them think in a different way how they organize their research on this sensible condition, this space in between what is underground and what is the sky. And the interesting thing is that by uh, reducing the factors of the research, to the idea that we have to document how we are becoming obsolete. We live uh, in a sort of economy, in sort of a culture that is uh, similar to the Neanderthals. So the Museum of Oil is a very strange idea. You know, we are documenting how we are making the decision to keep oil in the ground, but it's not clear whether we are in the future looking at us, having made the good decisions, or it's, if it's an impossible uh, decision to keep oil in the ground and make oil uh, something of the past. And so it's a uh, very strange situation. But what we intercept is this kind of situation. Other people sensing the earth. Other people measuring the earth. Other people trying to make sense of that space. And in this case, is a fantastic uh, mission of um, uh, Greenpeace following uh, the uh, start oil mission uh, in the uh, Barents Sea in order to make uh, these kind of images, in order to understand whether there's a gigantic gas field underneath the Arctic Ocean. What happens is that you explode uh, uh, high-pressure uh, valves, uh, makes a lot of noise, uh, moves all the fish around, the mammals are uh, distracted, of course, and uh, somehow the entire ecosystem goes away in order to get this kind of 
impossible to understand images. But those impossible to understand images are nothing else than very uh, simple drawings that encode uh, the geologist start sieving through, they start understanding whether underneath those explosions, underneath the uh, ocean, there can be maybe some oil. Maybe in those uh, ripples of those uh, diagrams, there's oil, there's gas. And so what is interesting for us uh, in the exercise of the Museum of Oil is to start understanding how the same image uh, that could be that of the activist and that of the geologist of nature turns either to preservation of nature or to exploitation of nature. It's always the same image. And for us, this is uh, uh, maybe the architectural uh, moment. So how do you go from these kind of situations to create these uh, very complex architectural representations that the geologists are doing? And architecture is somehow trying to catch up with the rest of the sciences in understanding how to sense that relationship between what is underground and what is in the sky and make sense for us. Another situation where uh, somehow sounding and uh, prospecting uh, is at play is uh, in the boreal forest, not in the uh, Arctic uh, seas, but in the Arctic forest. In this case, it's uh, in uh, Canada. And you start seeing these cuts uh, that are next to that big, uh, gigantic, man-made scar. There's all these other scars and this series of cuts in the forest and these pads are the larger element of the largest industrial operation in the world. And this is, where, this is the detail of the Museum of Oil. So what are these things? How do they operate? This is the Athabasca tar sands seen over uh, 15 years of satellite images. In red, you see uh, what was there 15 years ago, in green, uh, 10 years ago, and in blue, three years ago. And so you start seeing the rapid expansion of this thing. Just for you to understand the scale of the building, of this building, the little round dots up there, uh, the two red ones, together are the size of Manhattan. So this is uh, what happens there. But this is only a, a little fracture of uh, the architecture, the building that is the oil industry. So what happens is that if you look carefully in this forest, apparently intact forest, you start seeing these cuts, no? the ones that we saw from above. They are just cuts in the forest so that you can drive a truck. And the truck goes around the forest and bumps the ground and ec the echo comes up, exactly like the explosion in the sea, and you can start producing those beautiful architectural drawings or geological drawings of the underground. And that is what allows you then to think that that landscape can be an extractive landscape. And you can start producing this transformation of the sky. And in the transformation of the sky, you produce everything that keeps us alive. What you mentioned a nice piece. Uh, it's not my definition of uh, a territory, it's Bruno Latour's. Uh, it's, so everything that keeps us alive, a forest, and we saw how uh, it is now becoming the site of a, a new imaginary for architecture, is in reality sensed in a completely different way by the geologists. So the tar sands that are apparently the site of uh, the major protests, uh, what we focus on, are actually a little part of the entire system. What is at stake is a gigantic machinery, a gigantic uh, architecture that senses the earth in order to get more out of it, and more, and more, and more. So this is uh, where the Museum of Oil uh, comes in, because we know that we need to keep oil in the ground. So our friends go there, uh, climate crime, and uh, you understand uh, no, the impossibility of such a fight. But we also know very well that we can't keep oil in the ground. If we would keep oil in the ground, we will have to completely change the way we live. We will have to change 
the building codes, we'll have to change the institutions, we will have to change the architectural structures, we'll have to change politics, we'll have to change uh, the economical systems, we'll have to change different ways of so, uh, conceiving solidarities. So the architecture of keeping oil in the ground is an impossible situation because everything that you actually trying to fight is what keeps you alive. Two thirds of humanity are eating every day food that is produced through fossil fuels, injection into the agricultural system. So if we will have to cut that and withdraw from the world uh, as we know it, we will die. So what does architecture do in this situation? This is where the negotiation comes in. We think that the possibility of thinking that the space of not keeping oil in the ground and keeping in the ground is actually the ground. So what we think is that we have to articulate in detail the conditions, the territorial material conditions that uh, make it almost impossible for us to make that decision. So the Museum of Oil doesn't help a little bit Greenpeace in uh, outlining for them how uh, their operations are nothing else than a design operation of territories. So what we saw of the forest until now is nothing else than this image. And in this image, every line is a cut in the forest. The, I don't know if this has a pointer, maybe. The tar sands are these, that little thing. Everything else that you see here is a cut in the forest in order to prospect for oil. This is half of Canada. So what you start seeing is that you know, what we think is the largest uh, organization, industrial operation in the world, it's actually a just a little fraction. The possibilities of thinking uh, of this uh, project as looking back at us from a nearby future and determining that we have to keep it all in the ground are very complicated because the information about oil is scarce. There's an enormous amount of data, but the information that you get out of it is so difficult to get. Right? It's almost impossible to understand oil. It's obfuscating. There's too much information. You don't understand really what's going on. So this is Canada, and in black, you see the protected waters of Canada. And then comes uh, a trade agreement between Canada and uh, the, United, the European Union, and these are the protected waters of Canada. The agreement transfers the environmental protection into a situation where uh, it's now uh, an economical advantage. So all those documents have disappeared. All the documents about uh, uh, environmental records about, the music about oil in, um, in Canada, uh, or oh, water in Canada has been uh, completely taken over. So, we used to have a situation where the atmosphere, the land, and the ocean were uh, in exchange, the Earth system. And then we took the fossil fuel and we put it in the atmosphere. It's going to stay there for 300,000 years. Even if we stop today, the atmosphere is going to be full of carbon that is no longer radioactive. It's old carbon. It's going to stay there for 300,000 years, more than uh, the half-life uh, half of uh, the... Uh, nuclear uh, waste. It's not taken over by land, it's not taken over by the ocean, and if it will be taken over by the ocean, it will be acidification of the ocean. So the question is, uh, maybe if we let it go and continue like this, we take out the entire uh, fossil fuels and put them in the atmosphere, and then I really wonder who will be here to think of that. Maybe the bacteria that we mentioned before uh, might do something. They've done that revolution uh, three and a half billion years ago. So the question is that in that transformation, in taking fossil fuels out of the ground, we have nothing else than the creation of a gigantic new form of architecture, a gigantic building. It actually weighs 30.9 trillion tons. This is a rough estimate. So the project uh, of the Museum of Oil, and uh, I will uh, leave it uh, as it is, uh, is uh, nothing else than an attempt to document how it is difficult to think of keeping oil in the ground, 
how it is almost impossible for us to think that we can leave oil in the ground. The majority of the reactions will be, I can't. So who should keep oil in the ground? You? Me? I should have stayed in London and not traveled here, maybe. And uh, so the entire difficulties that we saw even uh, articulated in this uh, uh, beautiful uh, gathering today indicate that for us that what we need to do is to rethink territories, rethink what keeps us alive. And attachments need to be redesigned and rearticulated. And the Museum of Oil was uh, also uh, part of a big exhibition, so it's also something that becomes a larger uh, public gathering, where that discussion is not only demanded to individual conscience, but it's also uh, the possibility of architecture of uh, organizing that discussion as uh, a gathering space, as an actual convivial condition where people come together and discuss it. And the, the idea of the sensing of that landscape, of that architecture, I would call it, in between what is underground, the oil, and what is above, is then reproduced in this uh, uh, project that we've done uh, recently as a condition where you're experiencing directly the enormity, apparently, of keeping oil in the ground. But this is actually a detail. This is just a detail. So the question, uh, when you're dealing with projects like this, this is more uh, towards, uh, uh, say, the architectural audience here, is that, in my mind, you're dealing with two difficulties. The first one is that you don't have to make it too big. And if it's too big, you're just demoralizing everyone and uh, nothing will happen. But also, if you make it too small, it becomes difficult to handle. So the question is really, for me, one of uh, designing uh, that condition where you understand that it's still manageable, you can still do it, if you gather and uh, you multiply agencies, and maybe not only make them human agencies, but you articulate uh, human agency with uh, non-human agency, that means animals and plants, or post-human agencies with machines and uh, other conditions. And the question of uh, the dimensions, the magnitude, is for me uh, where architecture somehow still can be relevant today in thinking climate change, because, uh, no, to avert climate change. We haven't really experienced climate change, just to make clear. We are in the Anthropocene, where climate change will come. If we gather uh, that capacity of uh, the magnitude to be punctual enough to push the body and make it do something for us, then the amazing capacity of architecture of organizing conviviality and uh, living together might be the way forward. So this is where I still think that architecture carries an enormous intelligence in thinking how we can live together on the planet. And yeah, that's uh, a few of the things that I wanted to tell you. Uh, so a territory is uh, nothing, is not a, a land. It's a system of signals to stay out. Stay out of what keeps me alive. So it's a a semantic condition, but it's not only our condition. It's, uh, it's a distributed agencies of uh, territorial warning system. It's an alert structure. And we can design them. The question is, uh, wh where is the negotiation? Who are we negotiating with? How do we uh, move towards a, a reconciliation uh, between the people that are so dependent on oil with those that will uh, destroy their lives. Because remember that the majority of people that are uh, suffering because of oil are the most dependent on oil. So when we're talking about uh, uh, degrowth or uh, stopping our economy, what will happen in reality, we know very well, is that we are exposing enormous amounts of uh, population to conditions that are not possible. So I think that this is uh, uh, the way through which uh, you know, very simple intelligence of architecture, scale, uh, dimensions, uh, sensing, drawing, uh, can somehow help a common civic discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the invitation to be here and also kind of after 
the inauguration of the exhibition kind of discuss some other work that we've been developing in the past years. The waters of sky have been changing color. We know that sea water has no color, but different color reflections enter our eyes and sometimes we see blue. Sometimes we see gray or black. Other times we see brown or green. Yet in recent years, multiple seawater has been dominated by different hues and multiple pantones. You are looking at Pantone 1555U. Are looking at Pantone 1565U. Are looking at Pantone 1625U. Are looking at Pantone 1635U. Are looking at Pantone 1575U. Are looking at Pantone 487U. Are looking at Pantone 486U. Are looking at Pantone 1645U. Are looking at Pantone 157U. Are looking at Pantone 1655U. Are looking at Pantone 158U. Are looking at Pantone 1665U. Are looking at Pantone 485 view. In Sky, we heard about a house sparrow that had turned salmon. House sparrows can be found in most places where there are houses. As their name suggests, they are one of the most common birds in the world. Female and young um, birds have brown, gray, and black feathers. While males have some sometimes less dull bits around their neck. The sparrow we heard about in Sky had turned salmon. It was believed to have eaten one of the feed pellets from a salmon farm. Like a flamingo eating shrimps, the sparrow also turned salmon. Salmon today would be gray, but salmon can also be red or pink or even salmon. In the water, the success of salmon, Scottish salmon, as a branding relies on coloring salmon fish into one of 13 salmon pantons. Farmed salmon needs pinky fine pellets to substitute natural krill, which is otherwise available in the water. Indeed, Scottish salmon today is neither entirely Scottish nor is it wholly salmon. 90% of Atlantic salmon swimming in the seas and shelved on supermarket aisles is a domesticated species. Since the 1970s, Salmon slowly ceased being an animal to become a profit equation. Selective breeding processes create fish which can grow much faster to market size than in regular conditions in the wild. The definition of wild in wild animals, though, is something that was made through the violence of colonial settlement. It is when nature shows signs of collapse that the distinction of wild and non-wild begins to appear. Wild salmon should simply be called salmon. As wild salmon was only invented as a label to refer to a system destroyed by humans that differentiates this domestication from the non-domesticated fish. And as Heather Ann Swanson remarks, domestication is, is what creates disorientation in relation to the environment. Rather than wild, it would be more accurate to say stream spawning salmon, as many times hatcheries enhance the spawning of salmon by bringing juveniles from elsewhere out into the wild. Yet farmed salmon clearly differs from stream spawning salmon. It is fed with fish or pork-based pellets, mixed with ground-up feathers, genetically modified yeast, and chicken fat. It is colored artificially with pigments that make its flesh acquire the ideal salmon tone. It is marked with a black spot from vaccination on its belly. Its adipose fins are clipped, disabling it from ever swimming properly outside the farm pen. It is heavily dependent on antibiotics to fight disease and parasite, like lethal sea lice, resulting from swimming in circles in close proximity. Grown in the cylindrical open nets containing about one million fish per farm, market salmon is severely affecting both the body of the fish but also the seabed. Hundreds of kilos of salmon manure sink through the open nets. Their excrements are deposited at the bottom of the sea, suffocating the entire ecosystem underneath and creating dead zones. Invisible suspended particles float away and give the water supplementary colors. These open nets function like toxic toilets with open water sewage, which is discharged onto the open seas by the tidal flow. One of the places we associate with salmon in Scot is Scotland, 
where salmon has been the food source for centuries. Since the 1980s, however, the appearance of a multitude of salmon farms all over the country have been dramatically changing the aquatic landscape. In 2016, a moratorium on fishing so-called wild salmon was passed in Scotland, as their numbers have been dramatically dropping. Fishermen have been blamed for its disappearance, while the environmental impact caused by industrial aquaculture is not held accountable. On the Isle of Skye in Scotland alone, 15 salmon farms are currently growing millions of fish per year. Recently, many salmon had to be sacrificed in Skye, as not even strong antibiotics could keep the sea lice under control in such high concentration of fish. Hundreds of thousands of fish have been exterminated in order not to threaten the entire industry. But still, the industry does not acknowledge any connection between lice infestations and the high concentration of animals swimming in the same spot. Farming corporations claim that the parasite is simply a natural phenomenon. Instead of sacrificing fish, the industry has, be has begun to try to kill off the sea lice with chemicals. Lice are becoming resistant to those antibiotics, so greater quantities have to be used, together with more toxic components that are frequently found in pesticides, herbicides, and some nerve agents. But today, Scottish salmon does not only come from Scotland. Salmon hatching row is part of an intricate transnational network of, of circulation of preci precious genes with eggs fertilized and incubated in different facilities and ready to be sent from farming site to farming site to farming site across the world. The Scottish Salmon Company has branded itself as the purveyors of authentically Scottish salmon. Despite being registered in Jersey, owned by a Swiss bank and with Ukrainian Norwegian investors, floated on the Oslo Stock Exchange and using important Norwegian genetic material for their farmed salmon. Greek Seafood Hjotland sources salmon from the wild waters of Scotland, sorry, of Shetland, but wild here refers to the water and not to the fish itself. It is no surprise that Marks & Spencer salmon brand name is Loch Muir. Indeed, a Scottish wilderness sounding name. Yet Loch Muir is a place that does not exist on the map. Aldi promotes best of Scotland salmon with an image of a fishing boat when it is actually farmed in Norway and the Faroe Islands. Morrison's promotes, promotes catch of the day salmon, which is sourced from farms in Norway, and Scottish quality salmon, which is farmed in Norway but only smoked in Scotland. The desire for consumption of Scottish landscape is rendered through fish matter. Five out of the six uh, salmon conglomerates operating in the Isle of Skye depend on Norwegian-owned capital and consist of corporations that were legally obliged to monitor the salmon farming activity in Norway. Despite disguising their operations through branches in different countries, the 11 largest salmon farm corporations in the world have still their headquarters in Norway. Given that the Norwegian government has been introducing more environmental restriction because of the detrimental effects of the salmon farming on Norwegian coastal waters, some of these companies have found fertile ground and water in less restrictive countries like Scotland or Chile. Marine Harvest, the largest salmon farming conglomerate in the world, is also operating in sky waters. When the Scottish clearances happened some 200 years ago, Thousands of Gael people were dispossessed, evicted from their villages, and banned from living off the land as they used to. Today, salmon farming corporations are replicating a similar process by clearing the seabed, and as more and more um, dead zones are appearing all around salmon farms. This new wave of oceanic clearances, we could say, is a multi-billion business, but only for a few. Therefore, Scottish salmon has become a brand that needs to be critically rethought, not only from an environmental and ecological perspective, but also questioning what Scottish and salmon means in that construction. Farmed salmon is the result of the fish becoming a product of bio-capital and biomass, And as Elizabeth Lee claims, it is a creature bred to be hungry and its job is to put on weight. In order to quantify the salmon success, the equation feed conversion ratio indicates the quantity of feed pellets, three kilos, 
that equal in biomass gain, one kilo. And that, that three to one is the efficiency ratio with which feed pellets are convert, converted into salmon flesh. The new feed pellet factory that has been built in Sky is meant to provide 55 jobs, undoubtedly an important and significant amount for such a small island community. Yet it is still not entirely clear how many will serve local population and how many will be long-lasting positions. At the same time, the new plant legitimizes the environmentally damaging presence of open net salmon farms in the waters around the island to keep up with demand. Salmon is the biggest selling seafood in the UK. But even if it's labeled as organic, there is a big disparity between the amount of organic labeled farms and the non-sufficient amount of so-called organic pellets available in the market. Besides, the fact that the fish component of the pellets is made out of Peruvian anchovies, among others, it is also leading to another form of colonization of the ocean, depleting resources for local fishermen in Peru in order to feed Norwegian and Scottish salmon on the other side of the world. Surrounded by the rugged landscape, indented coastline, and our lochs of sky, there are many ways in which market salmon performs nature. One of them is how salmon is bred beyond natural reproductive seasons. Year-round, consumer demands require the fish body to be constantly fertile. Farms in northern latitudes um, deceive the fish to make them think that they are living in a different time of the year. For that purpose, a black roof dome is sometimes added on top of the open net pens to distort their perception, as if they were living in a different season. In winter periods of 24-hour darkness, artificial fluorescent lights are turned on and off. On and off. On and off. And on and off. 12-hour cycles simulating light conditions of a spring, summer or autumn. Helped by artificial light under and underwater heaters, this light regime triggers the reproductive system by deceiving their sense of orientation. Continuous light accelerates fish growth so that the farm can deliver salmon all year round. Their carefully engineered housing conditions have the power to advance or delay spawning time to produce eggs out of season. 12 hours of light. And 12 hours of darkness. Some years have two summers. And others skip a winter. This accelerated growth has consequences for the fish, which among becoming insensitive and other physical deformities, has also damaged their otoliths and made the fish become deaf. Paradoxically, the fact that farmed salmon cannot hear reduces its stress from inhabiting the very noisy machinery of a floating farm. Another way to perform nature in a salmon farm is the creation of fake seaweed habitats as hiding spots for rust, a fish being transplanted from the southwest coast of England to Scotland to eat the sea lice that attack the salmon. Made with stripes of rubbish bags, these fake habitats allow rust to hide from the hundreds of thousands of fish swimming around in the pen and eat their sea lice comfortably. To such extent that rust, despite not being eaten by humans, has become one of the most sought after and expensive fish in the UK for this purpose. Another disruption of the reproductive system is the way escapees are trapped between being a domesticated and a wild species. Guided by a memory of the magnetic field or a smell of a place or even the sun, they orient their migration, and with it, they fulfill their sense of belonging. But bred in an onshore laboratory, farmed salmon lost that inherent sense of memory. It can no longer find its birthplace upstream and return there to spawn. It is disconnected from any natal river and disoriented in the sea, or providing that it ever escapes, where does it go? Homeless and outlawed, an escapee becomes an alien in its original river. In Norway, escapees are listed as a threat to the so-called wild salmon population. If they are mixed with their wild counterpart outside the farm, the new fish will be part of the disrupted system. Only a few months ago, 21,000 salmon fish escaped from a farm in Skye. This raises the question, 
Where does an escapee return to, or how can it find its way back upstream? If a farmed sam salmon tries to swim to its natal place to spawn, it sometimes goes back to the hatchery that created the magnetic or olfactory imprint in its brain. Farmed salmon is only recently becoming an animal and less a product, with more studies and regulations trying to understand its feelings, its memories, and its sense of orientation. The question still remains, what is a domesticated, cultivated, or tamed salmon? Is farmed salmon an industrial aquaculture success or an environmental catastrophe? From the local habitat to the global market, the scales at which salmon performs are yet to be decultured. After decades of overfishing and exhaustive salmon farming, Sky's waters have reached a point where seasonal productivity, ecology, and employment need to be rethought. Food seasons as we know them have ceased to exist. In a supermarket, you can find strawberries, tomatoes, plums, or even salmon filling the shelves all year round. You have all seasons. Beyond this flattened 365-day long season, what would be the new periods we could eat according to today? If humans have been changing the environments, how can we also change our food systems to adapt to them and build other forms of landscape? Climavore explores how to eat as climate changes, uh, a form of devouring uh, that follows the consequences of anthropogenic landscapes affected by intensive forms of extraction. Different from carnivore, omnivore, locavore, vegetarian or vegan diets, it is not so much the ingredients that define climavore, but rather the infrastructural responses to human-induced climatic events. New seasons of food production and consumption have begun to appear. Dry seasons are sometimes more arid and sometimes less. Rainy seasons are becoming longer but sometimes shorter. The number of frost-free nights has increased in some places but decreased in others. These non-absolute cycles are discontinuous, disjointed, disconnected, and non-sequentially repetitive. But do dropping water levels justify digging deeper wells to exhaust even deeper aquifers, or could we acclimatize our existence to flexible patterns beyond intensive water consumption? The newly imaginaries, landscapes, and infrastructures re reveal a new set of clues for adapting our diet, anxieties, or desires to them. Climavor aims to rethink the environmental futures of coastal inhabitation um, and the coastal commons through a diet that can effectively transform desires and infrastructure. In the case of polluted shores by salmon farms, it takes the tidal zone as an ambiguous site that appears, disappears, reappears, and constantly changes in size. Coastal space has no clear definition and opens up for murky yet cleaner usership and can become today the entrance into a new ecology um, but also to, to, as a way to rethink other aquacultures in the Isle of Skye and its tidal zones to become a site of opportunity for more sensitive practices. Human-induced climatic alterations of the waters, ranging from increasing acidification of the ocean, appearances of new parasites, and disappearance of species, could be approached through other forms of eating and sourcing of nutrients. Different from intensive salmon farming that produces an excess of nitrogen, other creatures do opposite processes. They clean the water by breathing. So do other filter feeder bivalves, like clams, racer clams, scallops, barnacles, but also seaweeds, um, like kelp, sea lettuce, or dolls. They all provide an incredible source of easy access protein without any need for feed or fertilizers. Despite having lost connection today to some of these ingredients, they were abundant and used both by humans and animals. There are archaeological remains of prehistoric sheep in Scotland in their, with marks in their teeth that indicate a kelp-based diet. And even in modern times, a booming industry in Sky emerged of four kelp-based explosives during the Napoleonic War of, no, Wars of the 1820s. Kelp was used to improve poor soils for millennia. In places like Jersey, in the Channel Islands, the use of seaweed collected from the ocean as fertilizer had been a common practice, with laws explicitly regulating citizens' rights, but also the optimal seasons for its gathering. Certain varieties, like kelp or bladderwreck, 
had ab abounded quantities of minerals that once laid on the fields would slowly be released and accelerate the growth of vegetables and tubers. Crofters have used the tidal zones not only for fish traps, where all sorts of fish were, would be caught by the low tide, but also to forage dulse and eat it raw or boiled in soup. Over centuries, food sourcing from the tidal zone enabled social structures where women were the strength of fishing economies. From sorting oysters in the beach, lifting the catch, to carrying their husbands to the shore. Oysters have also been cheap sources of protein. In the east coast of the US, uh, oyster traders had these hybrid house barges from where they would moor in different piers to sell their stock to wholesale suppliers. Their mobile barges were a hybrid between a fishing facility, a shop, an impromptu eatery, and a home altogether. After sourcing oysters from naturally occurring beds, it was later discovered that they could be grown in oyster tables. Structures going hundreds of meters into the sea where oysters were washed by the tides following moon cycles. In the Isle of Skye, our oyster table functions as a dining table and opens the discussion around other aquacultures that could happen. Every day, at high tide, the structure allows its 1,000 oysters to breathe while each one filters up to 120 liters of seawater per day. At low tides, the oyster table emerges above the sea and functions as a dining table where we placed some humans. Over breakfast, lunch, or dinner, according to the tides, performative meals feature a series of climbover ingredients, where workshops with fishermen, politicians, residents, and scientists have been held to discuss another culture, ima cultural imaginary for the island. Guests enjoyed bloody oyster cocktails, crunchy shingles, or lasagna for sure, amongst many other climbover delights. Aiming to divest away from salmon farming and develop alternative aquacultures, uh, a network of restaurants was also established, and each one replaced farm salmon with a climbover dish in their menus. We had a food truck, a local bakery, a pie shop, a bar, a hotel, or a Michelin star restaurant uh, serving climbover dull soup, cocoa kelp climbover ice cream, climbover kelp whiskey, twice dived climbover scallops, or climbover rope grown mussel nibbles. The ongoing project is expanding into a new permanent installation, the Climavore Station in Portree, to secure traineeships and placements for local teenagers from the professional cooking school. Through pedagogical and professional development, the future cooks of the island can start introducing a new coastal imaginary. The tidal zone is a space of opportunity for discussing the spatial constructions of the ocean and its shores to rethink coastal policy and facilitate small-scale independent initiatives, the Climb of Our Station will also be a new place to provide legal advice and consultancy on how to open your own oyster or seaweed farm, while supporting also how to object planning applications that are trying to open and expand salmon farms um, in, in Scotland, and all of these while serving uh, Climb of Our Dishes. Slowly, people coming up the sky would ask for a sky kelp, sky dulse, sky oysters, or sky mussels. Ingredients that regenerate the coast by breathing. In this era of increasingly evident man-induced climatic events. On the tidal zone, therefore, we can determine what we eat as climate changes. Thank you. Well, th th thank you, John. Uh, it was like fascinated to get to hear about the Museum of Oil. It's a project that we really uh, like and appreciate, also what he's trying to, to do. And maybe one of the, the questions also that um, for us would be interesting to discuss is this idea of not only just to keep oil in the ground and the kind of uh, frictions around that, but also uh, what you were saying about the different um, scales of magnitudes at which it operates, uh, and then as, as, a, as a first point, also connecting to the framework of the day on, on what is the building scale or how we move beyond kind of the immediate scale of the building or the built environment around us, but how do we consider the whole territory as, as a building almost or as a built infrastructure, be it infrastructure as such or, or the environment as such as a built environment. Um, maybe that one point. And the other one, um, maybe to, to think of, of what are the perceptions or cultural imaginaries we could 
think of um, concerning those different or multiple scales. And, and I think also if to kind of address the question of the cultural imaginary, also like the idea of the, the museum, right? And kind of how the, because I think it's a very conscious choice, of course, like to make it a museum of oil. And yeah. you touched upon it in the beginning, but I think there's like much more to unpack there. Yeah, the other day, uh, Greta said, ah, all of that is in, should be in the museum. You know? She was referring to politicians in Europe uh, trying to address climate change. And she said, all of this should be in the museum. That's the idea of the Museum of Oil. It should be dumped into the museum. It's not uh, the celebration of, say, it's a little bit like going to the British Museum, where there's a clear narrative that there's been one empire after the other, and then there's the British Museum mm, Empire. No? It's, uh, there's one, mm. uh, or there is a particular uh, open air museums that I really like, and those are the ones of the Pleistocene. Uh, and people having the Pleistocene uh, diet, and you try to be like a, uh, the caveman, uh, and you have to spend a few weeks uh, in the uh, Iron Age. Exactly like that. Now we are, uh, we are the Iron Age of the world. We're not advanced. Uh, we are uh, depending so much on something that is so decrepit. It's a zombie uh, economic model. Uh, the uh, way through which the oil industry operates is through a uh, similar way to uh, your um, salmon. It's through the establishment of a ratio. It's called the uh, reserve replacement ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, the more oil you have, uh, your uh, value will be uh, decreasing the more you consume. And so uh, you have to show that you will be able to constantly replace your reserves. But it's difficult to replace your reserves, uh, especially when there's nationalized uh, oil companies that take over uh, spaces from the, what used to be the, uh, the big oil companies. So you have to go to more and more risky places. You go to the Arctic, you go underneath uh, what they call the pre-salt, uh, just off the coast of Brazil. Uh, you start going and taking out uh, uh, the tar from the sand. And imagine it's sand with tar, and you have to take away the sand. It's actually, uh, it doesn't make any sense uh, uh, to take away, uh, to take energy out of the tar sands. You put in more energy than you actually take out. But what is important to understand in the Museum of Oil that, is that oil is, uh, of course, energy, uh, but it's more than energy, it's power. Oil is a commodity. When we think of uh, the uh, transformation of fossil fuels from being in the ground to being in the sky and in the technosphere, what we're describing is the financialization of the world, mm -hmm. is the fact that we are uh, living in a moment where the capital generated by oil makes more capital than any work. Any reorganizing uh, city or reorganization of uh, an economy can do. And so uh, it, the margins of profit for any operation are becoming less and less. And uh, so what happens is that you cut wages, you cut uh, social security, you cut quality of houses, you cut budgets for architecture, art is too expensive, culture you don't want. Uh, uh, and so you start seeing an entire depletion. That's why I think uh, really to understand how oil operates and why we should keep it in the museum and put it in the museum is that it's a zombie. It's dead. It's really too late. And even if you try to imagine a brilliant future out of it, and skyscrapers, steel and glass, New York and Chicago, that's the past. It's not something that we can aim at. And so the imaginary, mm -hmm. unfortunately, of oil is that of progress, mm -hmm. of democracy. It brings democracy and progress. And this is the difficult part. That's why it's so difficult to think uh, an answer to your question. Mm. Uh, what is the imagine social mm. imaginary? It's progress. Mm -hmm. So how do you make progress into something that is uh, in the museum? And this is where I think the argument of uh, a retreat or uh, doing less, I think, uh, finds difficulty. 
I think that has a little traction. Uh, I think uh, the majority of people that are uh, depending on our economies based on oil cannot imagine further cuts. No matter how much we would like uh, to think of uh, degrowth, uh, we are living in an impoverished uh, society. And, and I think that this country, uh, like the country I live in, has experienced recent political turmoil exactly because of that. The majority of people cannot afford degrowth. Mm -hmm. Make America, mm -hmm. what is it? But yeah, also, I think within, the, you were mentioned within the increasing financialization of the environment, of the built environment. Um, yeah, it would be interesting, something that we also think a lot about, like what kind of um, options or choices do we have as strategies, almost like from this idea of divestment, right? And I don't know if you were work, working in the past with Carbon Tracker or, mm. or people like these uh, collectives in terms of, or organizations, uh, like what kinds of tactics or spaces of opportunity within that idea of divestment could we think of? If that's a possible, maybe. No, maybe it's not. clear. No, you yeah. keep all in the ground means that you have to push wherever you can. Uh, the interesting thing for architects is to start thinking that as an architectural project. And this is where I would like to ask you, uh, mm -hmm. because it's obvious uh, that no, for me, the fo you, you mentioned Norway, and uh, Norway is uh, you know, the largest uh, financial machine in the world. You know, it's the largest uh, uh, fund, which is based on oil and salmon. So uh, my question to you is really, how much do you think that as a, a financial project? Mm -hmm. It seems uh, really interesting. That, no, I really like uh, the, the presentation is beautiful, but the idea is so beautiful because it somehow caters to those who want to eat oysters and uh, the most luxurious mm -hmm. things, which is actually a very poor uh, mm -hmm. Food, but I liked how you take that and you put mm -hmm. it uh, uh, upside down. And I think that is where imaginaries come in. It's not, mm. oh, let's imagine a new world. No, it's mm. a minute uh, mm. manner tinkering. It's mm. a, I think that what you are doing, and this is the question, I think in my mind, what you're doing is to show that architecture is an operating system. Mm -hmm. And the question for me is, how much do you think that you can reboot? Mm -hmm rather than uh, simply upgrade the operating system. Mm -hmm. Reboot. Reboot. Ah, reboot. reboot. Yeah. When you, uh, up, you, yeah. you upgrade, sometimes uh, the upgrade doesn't work and uh, your machine is stuck. Uh, do you have to reboot it or do you simply upgrade? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think in that sense it's, bring back I think one of the like early paradoxes that you bring in this like in your conversation right that it's the possi like in a way like we're in these systems that we cannot there's no like possibility like just to reboot the system and from there it's in a way like how do you I think continue to work within the problem I think one of the interesting things for us with like with oysters and bifabs in general that they are filter feeders which what it means that we they are filtering the pollution of the ocean that we are eating, right? And on, there's something there that in a way kind of not only kind of, and there are of course kind of certain grades and it's not that you eat, uh, you don't eat necessarily oysters that are coming from like heavily polluted areas and they could be kind of, they're tested, etc. but still, the components that what the oysters are feeding on is the pollution from the ocean. And in that sense, I think there is an interesting moment there that you have to come to terms with the fact that in order to continue living on the planet, you have to also consume the planet that we've created. So in that sense, I mean, I think, yes, there's like a possibility to shift like to imaginaries and, and to kind of maybe divest in kind of certain directions. The possibility to reboot, I'm not so sure. No, but actually, I think that that is uh, where it is all at stake, uh, whether uh, my friend Bruno Latour says a reset, but uh, it's actually reboot, I think. Uh, uh, it's a very uh, similar concept. No, you have to keep what you would really like to keep and reorganize 
everything, recompose everything so that you can survive, you can land. And, um, but your project, in my mind, does something more than that. It's, it's not a shifting of uh, imaginary. It does something really uh, interesting because it takes what we already know mm -hmm. being good and simply points it out again. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, look, you already have it. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, that is a gesture that is really interesting. <laughs> like you, when you mentioned the fact that there's no such thing as wild salmon. Mm. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, I disagree on that. But, uh, the, one of the uh, possible markers of the Anthropocene mm. is the fact that the uh, contemporary domesticated salmon has mutated. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have more and more um, evidence of uh, that kind of animals in the sediment than the original mm -hmm. salmon with the long... Mm -hmm. So there's a... Uh, particular condition about yeah. that. No? It's like we have more, uh, we'll have more fossils of chicken than any other animal in the world. That's the Anthropocene. No? But you do something really interesting because in my mind what you're doing is uh, diverting attention. You know, you're diverting attention to a, something that is uh, already there and the fact that you have to go out in the uh, tidal area and bring people mm. there makes other people change their mind. And mm. I think that is exactly what uh, architecture does. No? It indicates, it frames, it establishes something that is always recognized. Mm -hmm. no? It's not an, an invention. Uh, it's simply attention. Uh, mm. and it, my question then is really, how much do you think that is an architectural project or is mm. it an artistic uh, practice mm -hmm. uh, project mm. or is it an ecological project? Mm -hmm. I'm asking this in terms mm -hmm. of branding because uh, there's a lot of branding in the project. And I think that is a really uh, undervalued uh, aspect of contemporary mm. practices, how mm. much we can name things and we can assert them. Because I think that even in the very first uh, presentation uh, and in the early afternoon, it was no, a new company that is asserting that we're doing something. It's not just doing it and uh, you have to go assertive. And I think that this is an important part of architecture, you know, mm. talking about things, having convening like this one is mm. important. So mm. is it an art yeah. project or is it a, well, I think for a us, culinary it, project? Again, it, it, it is kind of, it's how do we deal with complex questions today? How do you kind of start dealing with mega corporate conglomerates? be it oil, be it salmon farms, be it financial structures, what kind of possibilities as spatial practitioners or whatever form of practice do we have to say something or to start shifting something? Because sometimes, I mean, Greenpeace has an incredible uh, infrastructure, maybe not that big, but compared to other people, it's quite considerable mm -hmm. in terms of visibility or, or human resources. Um, but from an independent perspective, what kind of small things we can do like versus these giants uh, that can slowly, almost like a virus, like, try to change things as a mode of intervention. And then if it's about the creation of space or, or the creation of alternative landscapes, I think in that sense we enjoy collaborating with whoever has um, a form of expertise, be it in the field of botany or marine ecology or whatever, or policy making uh, by bringing or, these politicians. But there. with the Michelin star. As well, yeah. but I think what is kind of at the core there that there is a question of organization, right? And there is, and that is, at the end of the day, it's an architectural question. And and that's, and I think this is also kind of to kind of in, to bring back the Museum of Oil to that, like also where is the kind of where is the space of organization there? Yeah. Because I think there's like. Of course, it exists like by the by the means of production, for instance, of the Museum of Oil. But it's something, for instance, that is not, or at least in the talk today, it's not something that is put like at the no. at the forefront no, of the today. of the no. project, right? But it's an institution in the making. Uh, mm. That's clear. No? It's an organizational structure, and uh, I think that is uh, uh, an important element. I think that. Uh, we share a lot of these discussions about how do you think an architectural practice as an uh, intervention in existing uh, mm -hmm. social structures, in, a, in existing practices of culture making. And so it's not about the object, but it's about mm -hmm. how you operate uh, amongst uh, things. And in that sense, uh, I think our little museum uh, is uh, like a strange thing because uh, it 
it asserts that it's a it's an impossible museum. First of all, it's not clear if it's in the future uh, or if it's in the past. So it's a really uh, bizarre thing. It's us in, looking from the future at us, or is it now looking at the, all the destructions that we've done and no, there's no chance uh, oil will win. So, but the organizational part uh, is also uh, no, pragmatically associated with uh, connecting a lot of uh, existing practices uh, of uh, activism. Behind the scenes, though, it's not really about uh, jumping off the oil rig or climbing down uh, the uh, facade of uh, the other oil museums like uh, Tate Modern or you know, all the uh, cultural institutions that are heavily sponsored by uh, oil. It's not that kind of thing. It's uh, an organizational structure behind the scenes. So it has to do with uh, having people from uh, say, a legal firm inquiring into our research material in order to pursue a, say, a case for compensation against shell oil. Or it's about uh, connecting a human rights organization with an environmental organization. It's about uh, recreating conditions that are mm -hmm. uh, apparently dis disparate, but putting them as an architectural project. In a way, uh, the, the work that you, you presented uh, in the context of uh, uh, cli a culture and a kind of uh, uh, a moment of uh, climatic priorities or a sensitivity to uh, climate, uh, it's, uh, if we read it from architectural practices, it's very clearly stating or kind of establishing a number of shifts. One is that your projects are highly situated. Uh, both of you presented or dedicated a long time to, to prepare the, the, the kind of field of relationships, the networks of interactions uh, that you're dealing with. And that's something that uh, uh, it was the center of your work uh, to also dedicating time to representing it, to present it, to, to constructing these realities as something that could be sensed. Uh, second thing I think that is uh, a notion of architectural devices or architectural uh, action as something that can only be read, I would say, in the, from the perspective of politics in action. So it's, uh, it's in, the, in the process of doing politics or politics to happen in between all these or as something that is collaborative between all these different actors. Uh, architecture is it's one of these political actors and, is oper and it makes sense as we read politics also as something that happens within time and through interaction. And I think that's also a very different uh, way of understanding the political dimension of architectural devices. I, I think there's another one that has to do with a uh, uh, huge need to acknowledge uh, what is the agency of architecture or architectural action in uh, uh, you, you call it uh, distributed agency or shared agency could also be called maybe like a, uh, 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 to acknowledging that there's an agency for architectural devices, architectural uh, action, but that is negotiated with others. And, and, but nevertheless, there's a sense of responsibility in using this agency and, and, and discussing what is the way that that agency can be effective and that also reconstructs a little bit uh, or massively what we mean by architecture. And you're, you're, you're bringing uh, the discussion of semiotics in architecture, communication, uh, imagination, uh, or imaginaries, uh, cultural dimension, and the, the, the political dimension of, of culture, aesthetics, sensing, reorientation, direction, pointing. Like it's, it's a very particular uh, vocabulary of what's the way architecture mm. makes, or what's the politics of architecture. So if we put all these things together, you're talking of practice, but practice is something different when it's dealing mm. with the kind of uh, uh, approaches that you're proposing. Yeah, on many levels, I think that what you're indicating is for us uh, thinking from architecture. We tend to inhabit, uh, in particular in uh, architectural education, I think a lot of discourses of uh, the discipline and the practice as if the world has to look into 
the architectural thing. What we are interested in doing is from architecture outwards. Actually, you know, our friend in Paris said they didn't want to come, uh, but they were a little bit, uh, it was a pity that they couldn't be here because it's so nice to be invited from Colombia. Actually, this is the least in interesting uh, audience that we can have you know, because we are preaching to converted people. You know, they're all architects. You know, these are all architects. They already know what architecture can do. The interesting thing is to be an architect and go out and speak to um, those who think that architecture is too expensive, it's an indulgence, and it will just uh, make, make things more and more expensive and it will stop the process. So that's where I think architecture can become interesting as a practice. You know? In the end, in my understanding, a professional practice is a very similar in architecture as in uh, banking or you, know, you have to scare your client. If you don't do this, many dangerous things will happen. No? Sorry to say this publicly, but uh, uh, you have to be able to somehow persuade certain uh, decisions to occur vis-a-vis -vis certain risks. And in my mind, the major risk that we are uh, facing today is the fact that we are overestimating the power of these organizations. I think that uh, they are so outstretched they appear gigantic and everywhere, but actually they went thin. And when you go thin, you are simply overstretched and you become fragile. Uh, and to me, that is uh, where architecture then can intervene and uh, organize things. And so it's about thinking exactly like you say, a device that uh, somehow can put pressure in the right moment, in the right places mm -hmm. on conditions that are already overstretched. Yeah. The risk that the oil industry poses on our economy is much larger than the advantages that it gives. Much larger. And we're talking about a possibility of a mega recession that will be in, you know, in magnitude much larger than that of 2009. If the oil industry goes bust, and it could go bust, look at what has happened in this country with the shale boom and the derelict landscapes that it has left behind. No. If the rest of the industry goes bust, and it could go bust, look at what's going on in Saudi Arabia and the convulsions of uh, the Saudi uh, structures no, that are trying to offset their risk on everything, everybody else. Now they make it uh, even so abhorrent. No? If that goes bust, we all suffer. So how do we redesign it from within? This is, the, to me, the difficult thing. But it's so fragile. It's so fragile. And your project of uh, the farms uh, in Scotland makes it very clear. If people start wanting clams, what's the, pro what's the project for mm. the Scottish uh, salmon? Mm -hmm. it, it is marketed today as something uh, exclusive. If that it becomes evident that it's something that people don't want, they are dead business. Mm. Mm -hmm. Their risk is too high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, like, could you talk a bit more about maybe your experience in kind of dealing with practice or the work of territorial agency in international fora like the UN or also dealing with even like Greenpeace as a global NGO and how either in terms of uh, response to the work or, or, or almost like small shifts that might have happened by discussing the work of territorial agency in such fora. And, and I think also that because I think it ties also to the question of you, Andres, is that the questions that we are posed with today need kind of require developing new forms of practice within like architecture as well. It's a difficult if it could be public. It's, uh, no, it's a difficult <laughs> question because it remind, it's a self-reflexive question. So for us, territorial agency is not an agency like an office. Uh, it's a project that to recognize agency in territories. That means uh, that there are existing structures of risk that are existing, and uh, they carry capacity to act. So when we are engaging, and we decided early on uh, with Anne-Sophie that we will be engaging with uh, uh, organizations, both uh, local or international, in uh, making them understand that they are op operating in those 
territories. And uh, if they understand their territories, they will come up with better solutions than any architect can come up with. No, it's uh, their interest. It's what keeps them alive. And so they have to organize <coughs> that spatial structure, which doesn't mean a continuity. On the contrary, it's very complex spatial organization. And the ro our role <coughs> is simply to make them more alert to that mm. condition. So how we do this practically, uh, since we are in a school of architecture, is that our office is super small. We have uh, gigantic projects, and every one uh, of them is probably, m many of you might think, even more megalomaniac than the other. Uh, oil, after oil, we're doing oceans, uh, because we <laughs> thought oil was too small. Uh, but in reality, they're very small projects. Uh, we have uh, a very uh, small uh, team that we embed in the organization that we partner with. So it's not that we have uh, dialogues that are uh, frontal, but they are lateral, because uh, we uh, put uh, three or four uh, people on the top floor uh, of Greenpeace working in a booth uh, amongst the other researchers and helping them. And uh, so they uh, start collaborating in a different way, or we uh, in simply go uh, in uh, Rijkswaterstaat, uh, the M Ministry of Water and uh, Infrastructure in the Netherlands, and we take existing uh, solutions and we make them collaborate by having uh, one or two people working with uh, them. So it's a very small, minute intervention in existing large organizations. Even uh, the work and it's two or three projects that we are trying to do with the uh, uh, the United Nations. There are, it's not the United Nations a big thing. No, there's one uh, about ocean data, how to create an ocean data alliance so that you start thinking of data about 71% of our planet being shared. Uh, and at the moment, it's not shared. And uh, if we start sharing that, maybe we can act better. So you have to. And then uh, you go back to what Andres is saying. You have to describe your entire project as an analysis of your client or your partners. You have to be so clear about what you think they are and communicate it constantly to them. And say, I think that you're doing this. It's not always nice for them to hear because uh, maybe they misunderstand you. Other times they uh, endorse you, but no, it's, the negotiation is mainly with who you collaborate with. And uh, if you're lucky, uh, then you can push a political agenda that is uh, larger or sometimes even uh, local. Uh, we are very proud about how we have very small projects as well. They're not so uh, exhibited. So. Um, well, first of all, m many thanks for these fantastic presentations and for the summit in general. Uh, I would like to ask you something that is very much related to this last question, precisely about processes, and I would like to ask you both about time and temporalities at some point, because um, you were talking about different scales, um, physical scales that could come from a microbiological scale to large territories or even, you know, oceans, as uh, Jung was saying. Um, with temporalities, you are doing exactly the same. You are talking from geological times to seasons to daily life or even to possible futurities. So my question would be, how do you deal with time and how do you deal with these temporalities, not only from a human perspective, but also from an interspecies perspective, because also both of you are talking not only from human perspectives, but from some other uh, uh, agencies, let's say. Um, well, I mean, I think just maybe in very practical terms, I mean, I think one of the things, like once that you commit or kind of see the opportunity in the tidal zone, right, is kind of uh, a space of ambiguity, as a kind of um, a murky sp like space of governance that is controlled by a certain kind of time frame, right? And kind of that a project becomes completely subjected to it. When, like from extremely practical things of like when you can go install, you know, like when you can actually stand and when do you drown? And, and how does that 
start to really not organize on is not an event, right? It's not only dictates the moment of like when you have dinner or breakfast, but it really starts dictating the whole kind of mode of action of the project, right? And like how do you really commit to these cycles and to the opportunities that they, they bring? And in that sense, also the longevity, you know, the life that takes oysters to, to grow is, is also is much longer than the amount of time it takes a salmon, for instance, to grow. And what do you do with that time in, in thinking of like business, like a business structure of the possibility to make a luxurious item, something that is kind of, can be again consumed by people as it was done for like hundreds of years. Always, you're always asking the most difficult questions. <laughs> no? And it's always about time, you start knowing you. The, uh, it's not really clear for most of us, but the time we are in now, the Anthropocene, is one of the five major revolutions of the planet. Five. Yeah. The other, no, one of the others includes the great oxygenation, or oxidation, if, if you're careful. Yeah. That means you know, what we're dealing at the moment is a, in a very limited time span, something that we think it's a, a, maybe a news uh, feed. Uh, in a few years, we have created an event uh, really from uh, the late 80s until now, we created this gigantic event, which is knowledge of climate change. So in 20, 25 years, we created this event that allows us to understand five billion years. What we're doing now is you know, comparable to the five billion years of the Earth. And, but I'm interested in the the event of the knowledge of climate change, which is the last 25, 30 years, and which is very complex uh, system, uh, full of uh, convulsions, negations, and the uh, fights, and the uh, uh, aspirations, and all kinds of things. But we are in that event. So I think that uh, that event uh, is for us uh, the uh, interesting time. We are at incredible times. IPCC tells you 11 years and counting before we have to radically change our system. If you read carefully uh, and uh, understand the implications of the 1.5 degrees, that's 1.5 degrees globally, which means some areas will be well above that. And uh, our friends uh, in London who try to block uh, Copenhagen uh, COP uh, would, would have said, no, it's impossible to ask large populations to be in three degrees because it means that they don't have food. Uh, so how can you sign up to that agreement? I know that this country is trying really hard to pretend that you're not uh, actually coming out of the uh, Paris Agreement. But in the Paris Agreement, uh, which is part of this event, there's something phenomenal. We all sign up as members of this international community to the fact that we need to stay within the two degrees at the end of the century. Already we start thinking ahead. But at the same time as you're doing that, you realize that you need five and a half planets to stay like that. So what, what's going on? So the question of time uh, is really uh, mind-boggling. There's another element that I think about this uh, constantly. No? The carbon that we are putting in the atmosphere, and it's going to stay there for a long time, it's old carbon. There's a fantastic scientist in London, and she's calculated that the ratio at which we are putting new carbon in, uh, or old carbon in the atmosphere is making the new and the old carbon similar uh, ratio, similar to what it was in year 1000. So by 2050, we'll have a situation where we cannot distinguish whether we are in the year 2050 or in the year 1000 in terms of uh, carbon dating. Because uh, there's old carbon that is not radioactive. So the amount of uh, radioactive carbon will have decreased so much in, com in 
comparative terms. So what it means is that the future is the past. So how can you start even uh, thinking uh, that? I, so time is the most difficult element of the project, and we only have 11 years. So it's, it's the most difficult question, I think. Uh, and it's not even an issue of urgency, I think. It's not that. I think we are more in a situation like uh, Cuvier that tries to explain uh, geology to the French. And he, the only way that he can explain geology to the French is to tell them it's a revolution, exactly like what is happening around you. you know, uh, really, at the beginning of the ninth of the 19th century, a few years after the revolution, uh, goes in public and geology is a revolution, like you had a few years ago. And that's the situation we are here uh, discussing. We are completely puzzled. I am puzzled, I don't know you, but I'm completely puzzled by the Anthropocene. I think that the Anthropocene is the most incredible solution. Well, we think always that the revolution is about to come, but in, in the Anthropocene, it has already happened. It's uh, 1950, uh, everything has changed. So how are we going to act on something that has already happened? When all our social dis uh, organizations are about progress, about doing something better, but we should have done something better uh, already before. What are, are we post-revolution, uh, before revolution, pre-apocalypse, post-apocalypse? That to me is mind-boggling. I cannot put my head around it. Well, maybe we can leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you.